Good evening and welcome. Please make yourselves comfortable. I actually prefer not to use the mic, and I believe uh, everybody will be able to hear me. Thank you. Feel free to move up closer if you'd like. Make yourself comfortable. It's going to warm up. The heat is on. We find ourselves in Shnas Hakel. The purpose of a Hakel is for people to gather together. Luman Yishmu, Luman Yilmudu. Occasionally you have a community-wide Hakel, a block Hakel, a bunk Hakel, a shul Hakel. And this is a unique and special Hakel for parents of 12-year-old boys who are about to make a bar mitzvah next year, Mir Hashem. And the purpose of tonight's meeting is Luman Yishmu, Luman Yilmudu, so that we can learn together and hear and share everything that we're able to about making a bar mitzvah. I want to thank everybody for coming on a weekday night. It's not always easy. Baruch Hashem, the weather was okay. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, there's various different types of people in the crowd. Some people on their way here, probably uh, maybe a spouse looked at a spouse and said, wow, I can't believe we're making a bar mitzvah already. It's your first child, it's exciting. You've never made a bar mitzvah before. You're taka wondering. Some people here may have made bar mitzvah already two times, three times, four times. But uh, Mir Tzashem, the goal is to go through everything. And I believe that there's something for everybody to hopefully be inspired and learn tonight at tonight's event. So when your son turns 13, he becomes a Ben Yud Gimel Mitzvah. He becomes Mechayev in all the mitzvahs, in keeping Torah mitzvahs. Why? Because when you turn 13 years old, you become a bar das. When you're 13, it's when you are responsible, it's when you're able to make good decisions, it's when you're able to have mayach shalat al and only then is a fear to make you responsible. So when you turn 13, you become a bar das. On that same very day, at that moment, you become ben yud gimel mitzvahs, you become mechayiv and keeping kala terakula. So the theme of tonight's event is that 13 is not just an age, it's a stage. It's a whole new stage in somebody's life, in the life of a young man, of a young boy. In Mir Hashem, everything that we're sharing on the slides tonight, we'll share as a PDF and we'll put it out in an email and on the WhatsApp so you can see everything that's on the slides. You don't have to take any pictures or jot anything down. Additionally, this year we have a handout, which I hope you all received on your way in. It looks like this, and you could follow along as this handout very much follows along with tonight's presentation. I do want to take a moment to thank Mrs. Bayarsky, who attended this event last year and put this together for us based on last year's recording. This year's presentation was slightly updated as we update it every year, but if you follow along in the handout, it will very much match the slides, and the slides will be shared with you as well, Amir Tzashem. So the theme of tonight is 13 is not just an age, it's a stage. But truthfully, this stage of 13 really begins a little bit now when your son is already 12 years old. Because when your son is 12 years old, he's called a Mufla HaSamach Ish. The Gemara Masech Nazir learns out from a Pasuk, Ish Ki Afli Neder, there's some extra words there. And the Gemara learns out, what is the extra word there come to teach us? that a boy who turns 12 years old or a girl who turns 11, if they're smart enough and able to understand what it means to swear in the name of Hashem, then they are mechoyev to keep their vows. They are mechoyev to keep their nether. So that's a fascinating thing. You're mechoyev to keep kala terakula when you turn 13, but there's actually one mitzvah, the mitzvah of ishki afli nether, the mitzvah of keeping your vows, of keeping your nadarim, your mechayif to keep from when you're 12 years old, if you make a vow, and you're competent enough to understand what you're doing. Now, we all know that the Rebbe would send letters to people for life cycle events, for an upsharnish, for a bar mitzvah, for a chasana, for moving into a new house. In the early years of the Rebbe's Nesiyas, there used to be a letter that the Rebbe would send to boys when they turned 12 years old, and it was called the Mufla HaSamach Ish letter, because Mufla is like from the word Ish Kiyafli Neder, that's the Lashon of the Pasuk and of the Gemara. And the Rebbe would write this letter to boys when they turn 12 years old, because when you turn 12, because you already have that one mitzvah, it really puts you already into this process and it means you have an added responsibility. So I'll briefly read one quote from this letter, 
where the Rebbe writes, By Kaisav Aides he giacha le gil mufla le ish, Utavakesh es avicha vechein es rashi yeshiva shacha. You should ask your father or your rashi yeshiva, le hasbircha inyan de mufla le ish, to explain to you what this concept is of mufla le ish. Vachrayus hanesephes la yedei zen, the added responsibility that a 12 year old boy has because he is in the status of a mufla samach le ish. And the Rebbe says that he hopes that through explaining this to your child, something that you could all do tomorrow. This will add in your child a ratzin and a chayfitz to learn with more asmada, more shkida, the way it's surpassed for a Talmud in, in time of chitzmimim. So at 12 years old, the process really begins. That's the age that they're in right now. Another thing to notice about somebody who's 12 is that chinuch is from when a child is born, year one, two, three, all the way until they're 13 years old. It continues. But the training, the chinuch that happens, happens until 13. Once they turn 13, it's not a training anymore. Once they turn 13, it's for points, it's real. And perhaps there's a, a misconception out there about Sivis Hashem, because everybody knows the Rebbe started Sivis Hashem approximately 42 years ago. Uh, in Tav Shem Amalif, on Sukkot, the Rebbe launched Sivis Hashem and assigned up the children to Sivis Hashem. So people think that children are in Sivis Hashem. When you turn our mitzvah, you're no longer in Sivis Hashem. But that is the opposite of the truth. The truth is that when you turn bar mitzvah or bas mitzvah, that is when you become a full-fledged member of Klal Yisrael. That is when you become part of Tzivis Hashem, part of the Tzava, the army of Hashem. That is when you have the mission. That is when you have the mandate. That is when you're mechayif to keep Kala Terukula. The Tzivis Hashem program that the Rebbe started 42 years ago was a training program for children to get them used to listening to the commander-in-chief and to listening to their parents and listening to their teachers so that they can learn that, 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 authority, that authority and that discipline. And then when they turn 13, they should be trained and ready to truly enter Tzavis Hashem and be a full-fledged member in Kla Yisrael. So two years before Tzavis Hashem was launched, the Rebbe wrote a letter to Alitair for their dinner, as the Rebbe would write a letter to Alitair for their dinner every year. And this is already two years, you already see this theme in the Rebbe's letters, so the, the dinner took place in the parsha, the week of Parshas Bamidbar. And Parshas Bamidbar refers to the Yidin as Tzav as an army. So the Rebbe over there talks about how children are uh, part of Tzavis Hashem, and they're in the army. And then if you see the next paragraph, the Rebbe writes, But in order to do that, one must have the proper training. A good soldier is not born. He must undergo a period of training, undergo a strict and meticulous discipline. And this is the function of Chinuch. True Jewish education, the kind of chinuch which the Educational Institute Ali Torah has dedicated and has been highly successful with Hashem's help and yours in raising Tzivay Hashem, of whom we can all be proud of. So as we're approaching the Bar Mitzvah, it's important for us to realize that while they're still young, this is our last chance and this is our, our chinuch. I remember when I went to camp, you would practice the song for Kalawar again and again and again and they always tell you, okay, this is the last practice. The next one's for real, the next one's for the judges, the next one's for points. So when your child is 12 years old and he's already a mufla samach the ish, we need to realize that we need to realize that his bar mitzvah is approaching and we have to up the training and take it only more seriously and he should be fully ready for when he turns bar mitzvah. So tonight's event, which talks about this stage of turning 13, we will a mitzvah cover everything, Lina there, from when a boy turns 12 years old up until his bar mitzvah and until his aliyah which comes after his bar mitzvah. The main theme of tonight's event is that because it's such a big event, it requires preparation from the bar mitzvah boy and from the parents. And we're going to divide tonight's evening primarily into two parts about the bar mitzvah boy and about the parents. The goal is to be as resourceful as possible, to share as much guidance and guidelines as possible. And needless to say that many points tonight some will be halacha from Shulchan Aruch. Some are going to be clear high rise of the Rebbe. Some are going to be practical tips of making a bar mitzvah as a parent of Ali Taira or as a boy in Kradites. Some will be common sense. And the Mirza Hashem will go through that and will try to identify everything as we go through that in Mirza Hashem. I believe strongly that if we understand what's happening and if we understand what we're doing, we do it with more meaning, we do it more correctly. And therefore, before we go through everything, it's important to understand what happens when somebody turns 13 years old. So we mentioned that he's a bar das, and therefore he's mechoi mitzvahs. So on the day that a boy turns 13, he
He's meant to accept upon himself el taira and el mitzvahs, which means the yoke, the responsibility of keeping taira and keeping mitzvahs. Now you may think that it should be not a happy day because you're accepting this huge responsibility on you. However, it says in the Zayar that the day of, a bar mitzvah, bar mit, of your bar mitzvah, you're meant to be happy like on the day of your own chuppah. And in various letters of the Rebbe, the Rebbe referred to this oil of the Kabbalah's El Teir and El Mitzvah, the Rebbe refer, referred to it as an oil na'im, which means a pleasant yoke. It's something that we, it's an honor, it's a pleasure. We're excited to have this responsibility. And like it says in Zayar, that this uh, day when you ha- take this oil, this El Naim of Taira Mitzvahs, you should be excited and happy like on the day of your chuppah. Now, in the Alter Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch, quoted here in English, the Alter Rebbe explains that on the day that you turn 13 years old, is the day of Gemar Knisas HaNefesh Alikis. When a boy has his bris, his Nefesh Alikis begins to enter his body. It remains like that when he's 2, 3, 4, all the way until 13. The day he turns 13 years old is the Gemar Knisas Nefesh Alikis, the day that his Nefesh Alikis completely enters his body and now he becomes responsible and liable and responsible to keep Kala Terakula. In the earlier years of the Rebbe's Nesiyas, uh, Bar Mitzvah boy had the schuss that he got, and go, got to go in to the Rebbe for Yechidus. In 1982 in Tavshim Ambez, that stopped. And afterwards, the Rebbe would then do a Yechidus Klalis, which means all the Bar Mitzvah boys of like these two, three months would come into the Rebbe. First it was in the Rebbe's room, then it moved out to the Zal outside on the upper level of 770. Thank you. And then eventually it got such a large crowd, it went to downstairs 770. I actually, from my, one of my childhood memories, I remember attending this, one of these Yechidus Kalas, not the years I'm quoting, but a later one. My, um, my older brother's bar mitzvah was in Tavshin Nun, and by the Yechidus Kalas for the bar mitzvah boys, the whole family got to go. And I remember it because it was, it was, everybody was downstairs, it was men and women, there was no mechitza, but they were like divided, and it was a unique event, so I, I remember that. And at these Yechidus Kalas, and the Rebbe, of course, spoke to the bar mitzvah boys and their families about the importance of of our mitzvah. So here we're going to bring down from Yechidus Kalis from the year Tavshin Memvav. We know Yitzvah is approaching and everybody knows in Basil Ligani it says V'asuli Mikdash V'shechanti B'saycham that Hashem said make me a base of Mikdash so I could rest in it but it says B'saycham Lashen Rabim it doesn't say B'saycham in it it says in them because every single Jewish person has their own Mikdash Ma'at inside them. So the Rebbe said that on the day of your bar mitzvah is your personal Chanukah Sabayas. Just like there was the big event when the Mishkan was ready and they made a Chanukah Sabayas or there was a big event when the Beis HaMikdash was ready they made a Chanukah Sabayas. On the day of your bar mitzvah it's this great event that it is your personal Chanukah Sabayas for your own Mikdash Ma'at. And in the next year, the following year in the Yechidus of Tavshin Memzayin the Rebbe explained that Matan Taira happened only one time it happened to the Yidin over 3,000 years ago at Har Sinai. But every single Yid undergoes once in their own life, their own day, that is their own personal Matan Taira, and that is the day that they turn Bar Mitzvah. So we see that when you turn 13, something's actually happening. You're becoming a Bar Das, you're becoming Ben Yud Gimel Mitzvah, it's an El Noim, it's like the excitement of your Chuppah, it's like your own uh, Matan Taira, it's like your own Chanukah Sabayis. And in Tehillim it says that, Amar Hashem, Bini Ata Ani Hayoyim Lideticha. Hashem told David Melech, today I gave birth to you. And in the Zayar it says that is the day of his bar mitzvah. Because on the day of his bar mitzvah is the day that is, it was the Gemar. Knisa, Snaf Shalikis, which we quoted before from the Altar of Shulchan Aruch. Therefore it's like you were born today. You're a new person. You're a new entity. And this is a very, very special day. The day that you become the, the son of Hashem and you become a chayyiv and mitzvah and a full-fledged member of Ka Yisrael. So... Now that we understand the greatness and the awesomeness of this milestone of turning 13 and becoming Mechayim and Mitzvahs, we understand that it, there's a lot of preparations that need to happen. So I am going to put down now a list of different things that are done. Not everything on this list that you have to do. I'm going to put down everything on the list that gets done as part of our Mitzvah Boys preparations. We will discuss each one and then we will revisit this list, which is the million dollar question, which one of these things are a priority, which one of these things are not a priority, and I hope to answer that to the best of my ability. So here we go. We have, for Bar Mitzvah Boys preparation, we have to learn Hilchus Tefillin, to learn the Mimer, to learn a Pilpul, Kriya Satayra, Haftayra, to make a Siyam Amishnayis, to learn Yun Beis Prakim Tanya Valpeh, 
to learn how to be a shliach tzibur, to daven for the amod, and make a speech at your bar mitzvah. These are different preparations that bar mitzvah boys do, and now we will delve into each one. Each one will have its own slide. We're going to talk about it, and then we're going to revisit this list before we move on to the parents' part of the preparation. Let's turn, talk about Hilchas Tzvillin. In countless, countless letters of the Rebbe, the Rebbe stressed that the most important preparation that any bar mitzvah boy has to do for his bar mitzvah is to learn what the Rebbe calls halachas and itzrachas, the needed halachas, the halachas that you need to know how to live like a yid. Of course, you need to learn Hilchas Tzvillin. What makes Tzvillin different than any other mitzvah is that most mitzvahs they're already doing from when they're two, three, four, until Shaddai and Krishma, Tzvila, they're doing that. Tefillin we don't do until right before the bar mitzvah. So they need to learn Hilchas Tefillin, and they need to learn all the halachas of Nitzrachis of what, it, what they need to do to be a proper yid and to keep tired of mitzvahs. That is something that the Rebbe stressed in countless letters, learning halachas and Nitzrachis. So that preparation is something that we do in yeshiva, and I believe we do it quite well. We use the Sefer Shevach Yakar, which is a contemporary Sefer put out by Rabbi Horowitz, who lives right here in Crown Heights. And the advantage of using that safer is that it has everything from the Atar of Shulchan Aruch and anything that may have been added or that we know about from the Rebbe Zayrais or letters or Menhagim. So when you learn from Shavach Yakar, you know exactly how to do it. We learn it here in Yeshiva. We run a extra, they learn it in class, but we run like an extracurricular program. It's called Halichis Eilam. It's a competition. The boys get tested on it. They take two tests. Our seventh grade just took their first test on half of Shavach Yakar. Before Purim, they'll take a second test on the second half. We have a final after Purim, we have a chidon, there's money to be earned, prizes to be earned, and then there's a chidon right after Pesach. So in yeshiva, we pretty much take care of this, of learning Hilchas Tefillin. However, I do want to add that if you have a son that's having his Anachas Tefillin before seventh grade, some people in this room, their son might have Anachas Tefillin the end of sixth grade already, or middle of the summer, or in the beginning, beginning of the school year, and it may be that we did not yet have a chance to start learning it in seventh grade next year, I think it's highly advisable that a father should sit down with his son, open up a kitzur shulchan aruch. You don't have to learn every scenario. What's if you by mistake put in Rabbeinu Tam first, or if you chas v'shalom drop your tefillin? You don't have to learn all those halachas, but just the basic halachas of how to put them on and where and when and when to when to touch them during davening. Every father could do that with their son from kitzur shulchan aruch prior to his halachas tefillin. His anachas tefillin. Here you see some pictures from our uh, competition that we have the chidon that we have the alich esaylam. And the kids go on stage and they take tests. So we, we take care of that and we, we truly strive that our Talmudim should master Hachas Tefillin, which is the most, together with all Halachas and Atzrafas, most important preparation for a Bar Mitzvah boy to make. Mimer. So it is our minig that a Bar Mitzvah boy says a Mimer, specifically says the Mimer of Isa B'medrash Tehillim. This is something that the Rebbe told people, something that the Rebbe wrote to people. And it is also our minig that it should be learned by Peh. Here's a quote from a, a letter of the Rebbe where the Rebbe writes, Nog it's a kam of a kam of anchesh lemenu loimar besudis bar mitzvah, maimer da, hamaskil, mavayar, maimer rabbi lazar nisker lael, which is deep, uh, Isar of Medrash Tilim. In another place, the Rebbe writes, Mahanacha in lachzer, a bar mitzvah, maimer dibra, maskil, Isar of Medrash Tilim, vekal lamde balpe. It's easy to learn about pe, maybe not for everybody, but if you put your head to it, you could do it. Vegam benayasakain, your son should also learn this maimer balpe. So, I'll take a moment to pause. We have actually an exciting handout. Sikhas in English for the very first time put together a brand new um, lessons in Isab Medrash Shilam on the Mimer. It's not just a translation. It's beautifully well done. It's, it really teaches you the Mimer properly. Uh, it was not yet released. The, this is a draft. This is their first version. And this is a special printing that we have for tonight. Exclusive for the parents who join us here tonight. Um, sponsored by the Hickson family. And uh, thank you. And I do want to mention that tonight, Gimel Shvat is the yard site of Rabbi Yaina Afsin, Rabbi Yaina Brameyer, whose yard site is tonight, who is the founder of Sikhs in English. So, everybody on the way out, you will get this in the lobby where you did the raffle ticket and got the handout. You'll get this on the way out. And the one condition Sikhs in English allowed us to print it, especially for tonight, was that I announce as follows that if you find any mistakes, any corrections, please email editor at SIE, the email I believe is in here, uh, .org, I think, or .com, and uh, they would like to know before they publish it, you know, officially, they're happy to get feedback from anybody who uses this Emir Tzashem. So that is the Mimer of Isab and Medrash Tilim. Often parents ask me, do we learn the Mimer in school? We don't, 
because you can't learn Balpeh in school. It's very much a, something you've got to do on your own. You've got to sit down and learn about Balpeh. And to learn the Mimer inside is not something that's very easy to do. It's not the easiest Mimer. However, especially now with this uh, in English, if you want to learn it, before your son starts learning it, you tell him some points. Of course, in yeshiva, sometimes they bring a speaker who says over some ideas from the mimer. We do that, but we don't learn the mimer inside, word for word, and we don't, certainly don't learn the mimer in, uh, in yeshiva. The mimer is available in that sefer, Shevach Yakra, which I referenced before. The mimer is there with Nakudai, so it's suggested that your son studies from that sefer so he could properly read the words with the Nakudai. Uh, like I mentioned, it's nice if a father learns parts of the Mimer, even some of the Mimar Chazal, or some of the easier ideas that are in the Mimer. And regarding a tutor, so I believe that for most boys, no tutor is necessary to learn the Mimer. To learn the Mimer Balpad, the average student, the average boy could take the Mimer, set himself goals, especially if he has the guidance of his father or his mother, you break it down, you look at a calendar, and you set goals, and you have to learn about Pat. I can't put something about Pat in your head. The only way you can learn something about Pat is if you sit down, you have that diligence, you have that commitment, and you say it, Esau, and Reb Lezer, and you say one line again and again, and you, you learn it by heart, the way you learn something by heart. And for a lot of boys, there's no reason for them to have a tutor, so you don't have to have a tutor for the mimer. However, for some boys, it is a very big challenge, and it's a source of stress, and it's hard for them. So there are tutors who do help um, boys sit with them, and you could do that yourself, but I understand parents are very busy and you have a lot of children, so sometimes it's easier, you hire a tutor and they sit with your son and they set those goals and they test him and they make sure that he's up to date, but there's no magic to insert something by heart into somebody else's head. The only way to learn it by heart is if they're committed and do it on their own, so you technically do not need a tutor. However, tutors are available, and if you want a tutor, and this is something that will come up throughout the night, um, I play a shotgun role when it comes to the tutor because a lot of parents ask me, do I know of a tutor? And a lot of younger light or Bakram stop me and say, do you have any tutoring jobs? So anybody who stops me to ask me that question, I collect their name and I have a long list. Uh, just from uh, Elul of this year until now, I probably have like 30 people. And I, I do not necessarily know all of them. We'll talk about that later. We're going to have a whole slide dedicated to tutoring. But tutors are available for the Mimer if you would like. It's um, very important, I noticed, that some boys, they learn the Mimer ball path. They chazer so many times, they know it so well, they say it's speeding when they're practicing. And they knock it off, and they only practice saying it so quickly, so fast. Then they come to the bar mitzvah and they say it that way. And it doesn't sound nice. And it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it's bechavedik for the mimer. So it's much nicer. You don't have to go slow, but it's much nicer if you say it with the proper tune and the proper tone. Like, Everybody, you can articulate the words, people could hear you. And um, if they don't practice saying it slow, they actually can't. They're only used to saying it quickly. They go slow, they get stuck. So it's important, after your son is chazering the mimer, two, three weeks before the bar mitzvah, insist that he repeats it to you. And it takes time. If you do it properly, it takes 15 minutes about. Um, you should insist that he says it slowly and properly, articulates each word in a b'chavadik way, and then at the bar mitzvah, it will be a beautiful mimer, emir tzashem. Now let's talk about the pilpul. So the rabbi clearly instructed bar mitzvah boys that they should prepare an Indian and Nigla for their Bar Mitzvah. It is absolutely Minik Chabad that we have a Pilpul at a Bar Mitzvah. The Rebbe even once spoke about specifically that um, it should be in a Pilpul style, which a Pilpul style is not just a Dvar Taira, it's you say something and you challenge it and you bring another source and it appears to be a contradiction and you reconcile the contradiction, that's what a Pilpul is. The Rebbe clearly instructed many boys to say a pilpul at the bar mitzvah, and that it should be pilpul style if possible. And like I mentioned before, all the boys got to go into Yechidus to the Rebbe up until Tavshim and Beis. Without fail, from what I heard, every single bar mitzvah boy at the Yechidus, the Rebbe asked them, are you chazering the mimer? Which mimer? Or, and then the Rebbe always asked them, are you saying a pilpul? And which pilpul? And often the Rebbe would even ask them a question on the pilpul that they told the Rebbe that they're saying. And there's some famous stories about that. So this was something that meant a lot to the Rebbe, that the Rebbe instructed people to do, and asked every single Bar Mitzvah boy, are you saying a pilpul? Which pilpul are you saying? So we don't have a minig which specific pilpul to say, but it is our minig to say the pilpul. Uh, we don't have a minig of cutting off. I think in other cries, and there's a Bar Mitzvah boy says a pshatl, and you cut him off. That's not our minig to cut him off, but if you do want to have that, like the music cuts him off, and it's exciting, he should say the whole pilpul, start from the beginning again. We do that by the mimer as well. And then the music could go on. And this is something that I wish more Bar Mitzvah boys would do. Because this is something that's of high priority, as you'll see when we get to the end of these slides. 
Kriya Satayra. So this is one of the biggest misconceptions about turning Bar Mitzvah. There are people who believe that you only become Bar Mitzvah if you read from the Torah, if you learn the Torah of the Shabbos. And this is something that the Rebbe was uh, clear about on multiple occasions in a very unique way, where the Rebbe says it is absolutely not our minig that a Bar Mitzvah boy has to learn the Torah or read the Torah. It's not something that's required. It's not something that the Rebbe endorses. It's not our minig at all. It doesn't mean that it's us or to do, but it's absolutely not our minig. Um, the Rebbe has said this is not what you should be focused on because when you turn bar mitzvah, the main focus should be on learning halachis and entrachis, halachis and preparing your mimer, preparing your pilpal, and not this minig of just reading the Torah, which to the Rebbe had no value. So I have here on the screen, I'm going to quote one letter of the Rebbe here on the screen. There are various letters about this where the Rebbe says, You do a daiti bezemeaz. My opinion about this is well known from back then, for a while. Unfortunately, in this generation, it's painful, the Rebbe says, that he took what's a priority and they turned it into secondary. And he took what's secondary and they turned it into priority. And uh, if you read later, further in the letter, the Rebbe is complaining that they, they're mimait, they're decreasing in their limud of the Yisoides and the Ikrim, the halachis at tzrichis b'chai yom yom, the halachis that you need to learn every single day. And then they're unfortunately focusing on things that are that it was never such a minig, and we don't have this minig that you're supposed to read the Torah. In another letter, there's actually a family that wrote into the Rebbe after their bar mitzvah, and I'm not going to bring it on the screen, but this is another letter, there are a few about this. The family wrote into the Rebbe after their bar mitzvah, and they gave the Rebbe a report, and they wrote that the bar mitzvah boy leaned, and they were very proud about it. And the Rebbe responded to the fact that the bar mitzvah boy leaned, and it's a very long letter. The Rebbe gives more reasons over there. And in that letter, the Rebbe says that even though, so to say, this is my words, you don't cry over spilled milk, but the Rebbe says, even though the Bar Mitzvah happened, like, you know, what could I do? But I want you to know my opinion about this, and I want you to be mefarsim. I want you to publicize what my opinion is about this. And the Rebbe says that, unfortunately, these days, there's bichlal less hours of school than it used to be. I'm all boys were in school the whole time. There was no summer, no breaks. There's much less school these days. That's number one. Then the Rebbe says, also these days there's Lomodei Chayil, so so many hours of the day are not dedicated to learning Torah and to preparing for the Bar Mitzvah. And these days, all uh, families need to go on vacations. And then the Rebbe says, these days not just families have to go on vacations, they need to be Mahadir on vacations. So they have to be really careful and extra strict about their vacations. And the Rebbe then says that the worst part is that they're learning for the Bar, the bar Mitzvah boy, had a, teaching him at a lane, he's learning at a lane, he's not learning how to read the Torah, there's no skill involved, they're only teaching him that parsha. He learns that specific parsha. after that he does not know how to lane whatsoever. And therefore the Rebbe says, you should be mefarsim, my opinion that I'm not, I don't endorse, I'm not pro, I, I don't like this idea of wasting your time um, of preparing to learn the Torah on such a focus and such a stress, especially if it's coming in the place of all these other important achanas. So one may argue, and I discussed this with other people, and it's, it's a valid argument, I'm not, I'm not an authority here, but one may argue that perhaps for an Ali Torah Talmud, the, it would be more okay, or the Rebbe would be less against it, however you would like to word it. Why? Because in Ali Torah we uh, don't have Lomod we are Maisel Chinech Al Tarah and we don't have uh, much vacation. The girls have vacation this week, not us, right? And um, we don't have less hours of learning. We go eight to five, and we learn the halachas in yeshiva. And we, you could teach your son the skill. You could actually teach him at a lane properly, not focus on the sing song of his parsha. Teach him the skill. And if he has free time at night, and instead of playing on the computer or just fighting with his siblings, he's going to have now a tutor in honor of his bar mitzvah, and he's going to learn how to lane. Perhaps it could be okay, according to all the reasons that the Rebbe gave in that letter. You kind of check off each one, and perhaps that could. Um, the Rebbe, I think, mentions over there, if you had Zman Apanoi, if you had extra available time, like, fine. So perhaps an Ali Torah Talmud could fit into that um, category. But what's, what I'd like to make clear is that it's not needed to become a mitzvah, and certainly not a priority, and it's not something that needs to get done. And in other letters, the Rebbe always says, use that time to add in learning. Make al make al the Torah, learn, learn halachas, or even not halachas. Don't, you know, don't do this made-up meaning of, of reading the Torah. As mentioned, okay. Now, if your son will nevertheless be laning because you think that your son can handle it and you're taking care of all the priorities ahead of this and your son will lane, there are plenty of tutors available for that as well. You could reach out to me if you're looking for a tutor. Now, it's very important that you 
choose the right parsha because a lot of times boys, they're nine or ten years old, they're very excited, they open up a calendar and they say they know which parsha they're reading and everybody takes it for granted and they prepare the parsha and they're like a week or two off. Now honestly it's not terrible because it's not important to lane. But if you have your parents and siblings and everybody coming in for the Shabbos Bar Mitzvah and then you know, a few weeks before the Bar Mitzvah you discover that the last year he has the wrong parsha, you do have a little bit of a problem. So I suggest but before you just take for granted that your son said my bar mitzvah parsha is bar midvar, look it up yourselves online now with the calendars. It's much easier. Make sure that you have the parsha right. We had stories of talmidim who lame like two weeks later, a week later, because they they were off. Now, it's, what's very important to know is that when it comes to the mimer, and maybe even the pilpul, certainly when it comes to the mimer, I'm not saying this is good, but this is how it is. If your son's going to make a mistake, nobody is going to notice. Only the father who's following along inside might notice the mistake. And maybe the freshest bar mitzvah boy in his class who's listening in to see if his friend made a mistake, who still knows the mimer well, he might catch a mistake. Nobody else will make a mistake. So it's not an embarrassing um, public appearance for your son. However, if your son is leaning, he has to do a good job. He has to know well. It's very intimidating. And um, it could backfire. And he can never want to lean again in his life if he gets up there and he lanes and makes mistakes and it's in front of all the whole shul. And you always have someone on the show who's going to correct and correct even something that doesn't need to be corrected. And um, it could be a very um, un- unhealthy experience for your son. So if he's going to lane, he has to know, well, you have to really test him and tazer it so that he could do a good job and then be proud. And then Taka, lane the next week, and lane the next week, and encourage him to be a Baltaira. Now let's move on to the Haftaira. So similar to Kriya Satira, it's not at all our minute that the Bar Mitzvah boy has to get the last Aliyah, which is Maftir, in order to read the Haftarah. In a Chabad house, it's very common, maybe in other Kreisen, it's not a Chabad thing at all. Um, however, if you want to, if you want your son to do the Haftarah, it is different trap, and it's nothing that they ever learned in Yeshiva. The trap of regular laning, a lot of boys could pick up on their own, because a lot of Rebbe's, when they learn Chumash, they do it with the trap. The Haftarah trap is entirely different. So if you want your son to do his Aftairah and he's taking his Bar Mitzvah prep seriously and you have that extra time, it's an opportunity, you have a tutor, you can throw it in, you can learn it with him, uh, it's an opportunity to uh, learn it. It's not, it's not Minich Chabad to even get the Aliyah of Maftir altogether, and we're going to talk soon, we have a, at the end, after the Bar Mitzvah, a whole slide of everything about the Aliyahs, but Minich Chabad is specifically to get the Aliyah on Shabbos Mincha, which is a very special time called Raiva the Raivin, or you get it, eventually it was added that it used to be only Shabbos Mincha, Pikavala, like from the times of the Baal Shem Tov. But then it was added that also Mondays and Thursdays are considered an Esra in a special day. And you can get a Bar Mitzvah Aliyah on a Monday or Thursday. You do not get an Aliyah, your first Aliyah ever, on a Shabbos morning. So if your son's Bar Mitzvah is on a Friday, or if your son's Bar Mitzvah is on a Shabbos, certainly you should not learn the Haftarah because he's not getting Mafter. He's not getting an Aliyah Shabbos morning, so he can't do the Haftarah. If his bar mitzvah is on Sunday and he got his first aliyah Monday, or if his bar, mitzvah, his bar mitzvah is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and he got his first aliyah Thursday, you do have the option that Shabbos and Shol, he gets mafter, he reads the Haftarah, you make a kiddush, he may be lanes, you have that option. But it's not our minik to get the Haftarah, and it's minik chabad to get your first aliyah on Monday, Thursday, or Shabbos, Mincha. So do not bother preparing the Haftarah if your bar mitzvah is on a Friday or on a Shabbos. And here, it's even more important to make sure that you choose the right Aftairah. Because with Kriya Satairah, it's harder to make a mistake. But when it comes to the Aftairah, very often, okay, I'm leaning uh, Nasai. So you turn to Parshas Nasai, you see the Aftairah. But as you know, the Aftairah changes quite often if it's uh, two Parshas together, if it's a uh, Shabbos Rish Chaydesh, if it's a uh, Shabbos Machar Chaydesh. In the summer, you have the Shiva Dinachemta. And um, personally, my birthday is on Chafi Tishrei. And very often it falls out on a Sunday. And the following Shabbos is Shabbos Rish Chaydesh Cheshvin. And um, Shabbos Rosh Chodesh Chazim. So it's a different Haftarah. It's Hashemayim Kisi. And for my Bar Mitzvah, I did the Haftarah. Bar Mitzvah was on a Sunday. I got my first Aliyah Monday. I did the Haftarah. And uh, Friday night in Shul, I was sitting with my father reviewing the Haftarah the night, the night before I'm uh, leaning. And I hear a boy behind me, a boy from a different yeshiva in Crown Heights, um, who's a friend of mine. He was behind me and he's preparing his Haftarah. It was his Bar Mitzvah that week too. And it's an entirely different Haftarah. So we turned around and we asked him, what are you doing? He's like, I'm doing the Haftarah on Parshas Nayach. He showed us. He said, you know, it's Rosh Chaydesh tonight. It's a different Haftarah. And luckily they had at least one night to realize that uh, they were preparing the wrong Haftarah. And I don't know what he ended up doing. But when it comes to the Haftarah, if you're making that investment, really you should triple check that you have the right Haftarah being prepared. You have the Arba Parshas and you have Rosh Chaydesh. There's so many times that the Haftarah is not what it says on the Chumash, is that right after the Parshas. 
Tutors are available for this as well if you do want to make that investment, spend that time in it. Now let's talk about a Siyam Mishnayis. So the Rebbeim all made a Siyam Mishnayis for their own Bar Mitzvah. And they required, like the Rebbe Marash required of all of his sons, that at their Bar Mitzvah they need, they need to make a Siyam on Shisha Sidri Mishnah. Personally, I've gone to Bar Mitzvahs where boys made a Siyam on Shisha Sidri Mishnah. And there's nothing more beautiful than that. Sometimes it was the whole Shisha Sidri Mishnah. Sometimes it was a Seder of Mishnayas. Sometimes it was a Mesechta of Gemara. When a boy makes a Siyam on a Hesaf on the Torah that he took upon himself in honor of his Bar Mitzvah, and he had a goal to finish it before his Bar Mitzvah, and to make a Siyam at his Bar Mitzvah, it's very beautiful. And certainly, if you look at all the Rebbe's letters, it's something that the Rebbe encouraged to make a Hesaf on the Torah. So I would say, see, making a Siyam Mishnayas, there is a source for this. The Rebbeim did it, they asked their sons to do it. It's certainly a self in the Torah, and it's a beautiful thing to make a siyum at Yibar Mitzvah. And there's tutors available for this. This is the most prized tutoring job. All tutors want, sometimes they say, I don't want a kid who's struggling in yeshiva, I have to teach him the Gemara. Give me a smart kid that I can learn with him. Shisha Siri Mishnah, learn with him, you know, Ketesichas. So there's plenty of guys in Kailal who are looking for this kind of tutoring job. If you want to make that investment and you want to make that commitment, it's a huge commitment. Not everybody's up to it, but if your son is up to it, it's certainly a beautiful thing to do. yud based Prakam Tani Balpeh. Most of us grew up knowing that boys are supposed to learn or should try or do yud based Prakam Tani Balpeh for their Bar Mitzvah. Um, so, to the best of my knowledge, the Rabbeim strongly encouraged to learn yud based Prakam Tani Balpeh, but I have not found any specific source, and if anybody knows, please let me know, that it's something that you do for your Bar Mitzvah. It's something that the Rabbeim encouraged that a Bachar should know Yud Beis Prakam Tani Balpeh with the Hakdama, but I don't know it specifically as a Hachana to the Bar Mitzvah. Nevertheless, like mentioned before, it's a beautiful thing to complete in honor of your Bar Mitzvah. It certainly fits what the Rebbe wants. It's Aisafalim of the Torah. And I will add that the first 17 lines of Tanya Parat Memalev, the Rebbe, various letters throughout Igris Kaidish for different reasons, for people who have anxiety, for people who have nightmares, for people who have Machshav Azaras and Davening, for all different reasons, the Rebbe. And the Yechidasin, the Rebbe very much encouraged that Bacharim and Yungalite should know the first 17 lines of Tanya, Parak Mamal of Alpeh, or read it inside before Davani every day, know by heart, think it during the day. Different times, the Rebbe said it uh, a little differently. Um, in Yeshiva, we'll get to this later, we encourage the boys to be a Shliach Tzibur, to push themselves to be a Chazan from Mincha and Bishakras. And we printed mirrors for their Tfilim bag with this first 17 lines of Tanya, Parak Mamal on the back of it. And we give it to them as an incentive after they completed doing one mincha and one shachras. So we give it out. And usually, um, we did it last year. We did it maybe two, three years ago. We usually try to make at one point during the year a mitzah to get the boys to learn it by heart and to learn the meaning of it because it's all about knowing the meaning. So is Yud Beis Parkham Tani Balpeh something that has to be done for your bar mitzvah? No. Is it something that's strongly encouraged to do? Yes. And if you want to do it in honor of your bar mitzvah, I believe it's a beautiful thing. It's certainly a hisafa and limit the Torah that goes in line with what the Rebbe encouraged people to do. Now let's talk about being a shliach tzibur, to prepare your son to be a chazan, or to learn nusach for davening, like on Shabbos and Yom Tov. So some boys pick it up on their own. They don't need to hear a word from you. Not just they pick it up on their own. There are many boys who are extremely excited. They can't wait to be a shliach tzibur. The first night they do mayrev, and they do mincha and shachras. They're, they're doing every time they could grab the amud, it's theirs, they're very, very excited. At the same time, there are a lot of boys who are very anxious, who are nervous, they're, they're hesitant to do it, and they need to be encouraged to do so, and we encourage them and push them a little bit in yeshiva to do it. We don't force them at all, and I think it's something that parents, if you know your son is like that, you should prepare it, sometimes just sit down with him, go through the davening with him, and um, like this will be prepared to be a shleif tzibur. I believe that if a boy does it when he's 13, when he's 14, when he's 15, it'll be easy for him. If you don't do it, and when you're 20 years old, you want to go do it for your first time, it, 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 can, it can maybe be even worse. In yeshiva, we, um, we do a shliach tzibur training. We have a handout, we give the boys, we tell them everything that they need to know, the halachis, menhagim, practical tips, where to end off, and how to do naktishach, and how to do brechaz kayanim, and where to say kaddish shalom, and where to say chatzik kaddish. We do a comprehensive Shliach Tzibur training for Al-Tamidim in 7th grade, but we don't sit with each Talmud and, you know, model a whole chakras with them, something that a father could do. Besides for doing our Shliach Tzibur training, we also do a, we started, we had it one year in person, this year we started it over the phone. We do Chazar Sashat support, where the Talmudim call into a hotline, and they record themselves doing Chazar Sashat, which is an important part of being a Shliach Tzibur, maybe the scariest part for some boys, it's not just one line here, one line there. 
and uh, at least the Chazar Sashats, we then listen to it, and we mark off for them in a private, discreet way. We give them a report of where, which words in Chazar Sashats they need to fix up or brush up or they're mispronouncing, and they could then do it properly and be less frightened to do Chazar Sashats in public. And like I said, we give the mirror to incentivize the Talmudim to um, do it. Now, some boys are, besides for being a chazin for, you know, regular chakras, mincha, mayr, in the weekday, they're excited to do l'chon and uh, sheikhana, then maybe yamtif, and nusach, and every year I offer it to the parents. It only happened one year where I say, if there's interest, we could put together a group of boys after school hours, after their bar mitzvah, uh, not necessarily before, not to utilize the valuable time, where we could have like a training, I could hire somebody, and everybody will chip in. And they'll learn the nusach, you know, how to do a, a proper mayr of Shabbos, called Shabbos, and most of we've done it one year, it was beautiful, uh, but other years it was not enough interest. So if this, these parents sitting here tonight are interested, you can email me, call me, I'll collect your names. The minute we hit four or five people, it's something that we could certainly arrange in Mir Tzashem. And we can make nusach classes. Now let's talk about the speech. A lot of boys give a speech at their bar mitzvah. So at that speech, uh, it's you know, almost became a minig, the boys get up and they think their parents and they think their grandparents and their sisters and, and, you know, all the jokes that they make and they think all the guests that came from far. So it's nice to make a speech. I think it's a nice thing to do. You certainly do not have to. However, if your son is not saying a pilpul, then a speech is a great opportunity for at least that he could say a devar taira and an inyan and niglas. Even if he's not up to saying a pilpul, even though it is our minig and a pilpul is highly encouraged. But he's not, if he's not saying a pilpul, then encourage your son to make a speech and let him get up there and thank the guests for coming and thank his parents and whoever. And let him say a Dvar Taira on that week's parasha, even a classical Dvar Taira, like at the Shabbos day, we start with a question, you say an answer, you say a ira. So at least your son is chazring an Indian and nigla at his bar mitzvah, even if it's not pilpul style, there's still a, little, a lot of value to that. Before we answer the million dollar question, let's talk about tutoring, because it was mentioned a bunch of time, tutoring. So... All tutoring has to take place after school for, the, for your son's bar mitzvah. Why? We have 140 boys in the grade, Kenai Nahara. And if every boy's going to get tutored for his bar mitzvah during school hours, everybody on their own schedule, we could close down seventh grade because we won't have classes. Bar mitzvah year, you come to yeshiva, you do what you have to. We learn the halachas in yeshiva and bashvin uh, shtich tzibur and all the other things that we do in yeshiva. But uh, at night is the time that they have to learn their maimer, learn their pilpo, if you learn kriya satayra, that has to take place at night. This is, um, it's not necessarily with tutoring, but we're I'm mentioning after school hours, so I just want to give all the parents a heads up that um, your son next year, or when he starts learning for his bar mitzvah, has a built-in excuse for anything that you're ever going to ask him to do, whether you're going to ask him to do Mishnah or you're going to ask him to do Chidar Mitzvahs, or help at home, take care of the sister, go shopping, he's going to say, I have my mimer to do, I'm very busy, I'm stressed, I have my mimer, but realistically they're not sitting and learning their mimer every single night, because if they really did, they would know it rather quickly, it's not the end of the world for most boys, and I, I don't mean to, to judge the people who have a hard time, but uh, just be ready for this built-in excuse that my bar mitzvah is coming, and they become like exempt and potter from everything, and God forbid to ask them or put any pressure on them for anything because I need to learn my mimer, but they're not actually learning it, so be, be ready for that. And um, often parents are asking me, where can my son learn? You, you don't have space in your house, or you don't want the tutor coming to your house, and it's taking place after hours. So there are a few great places in Crown Heights where you could learn at night in a safe, open place. One is Yeshiva Serev, where for seventh grade, currently our Yeshiva Serev location is Crown Condos. At Yeshiva Serev, you're allowed to learn whatever you want, and you can meet a tutor there, and you can prepare for your bar mitzvah at Yeshiva Serev. You're more than welcome to. There's also three locations in Crown Heights, an open public base medrash with cameras, with access to the public, with people always there, Baruch Hashem. On Eastern Parkway, next block, there's one in Albany near President, and there's one on Empire and Kingston. So Yag Terra is a great place for boys to meet their bar mitzvah tutors. And also the Kailo often allows boys to come meet a Kailo younger man in Kailo. Uh, there's already various Kailos in Crown Heights. You know, five, six o'clock, you go meet a Kailo younger man in the Kailo, and you learn with him over there. So those are great, safe places after school hours where your son could learn first bar mitzvah on his own, in the first two locations on his own, or with his tutor in any of those three locations. So if you want a tutor, it's best to call me in the beginning of next year, unless you want to get learning now. Because my tutors, they change. Who asks for tutoring jobs? Usually a younger man, he just got married, he's in Kailo half day, part-time, a bachar, he's transitioning. 
then they, they, you know, they, they get married, they get jobs, they move out of town. So my list kind of goes obsolete almost each year and I start all over. I kind of wipe my list clean and I start all over. So if you want to start learning for Bar Mitzvah now, you can call me tomorrow, email me, I'll give you names of tutors. But if you're only planning to start Bar Mitzvah prep next year, there's no, I will not be able to help you to line up your tutor now because I don't know who the tutors will be next year. They change. There are some people who do this as a living and you know, there, there are a few like that as well. So you can call me now if you want to start now or in the beginning of next year. I strongly encourage that if you hire a tutor, it's your hiring them. You need to be comfortable with who they are. You need to do research on who they are. And if I give you a name, I do not necessarily know the person. People WhatsApp me. Uh, I heard you have tutoring jobs. Can I please be a tutor? And I just give them a link and I have a Google form for them. And I just, my list grows. Some of these, and I ask for references. And if they're married or single and how old they are. And if they're interested in bar mitzvah tutoring or other kind of tutoring, I ask all that in my form, but I don't necessarily know these people. So if I give you names, it doesn't mean that I vouch for them, that they're good, or that I know who they are. It's your uh, responsibility to do your own research. And often parents ask me what the going rate is, and I don't know, especially with inflation, I haven't checked recently what the going rate is. If I had to guess, but this is really just my own guess, I really don't know. I would guess that uh, the lower end average rate is probably like already $25 for 45 minutes. There are certainly tutors out there who take $100 for a half hour because they're considered the best Korea tutors. And there's certainly Bachram and, you know, base medrash who are only 18, 19 that will tutor during their lunch break for $10. Um, but I would say the average is probably $25 for 45 minutes, but I, I really don't know because I don't get involved in the money. I give parents a name for a tutor. I give the tutor the name of a parent. They speak, they, hi they get hired, they work together, they transfer the money. I'm not involved in that part at all. So for the million dollar question, which of these achanas are a priority, and a lot of it was answered as I was speaking. So just to be clear, I'm not the das taira here, I'm not the authority on this, but I shared, I believe, what the facts are with you based on my own research, based on what's very well known, and I will propose my suggested list in the order of the priorities of what, which achanas your son should focus on. Number one, hilchas tefillin and all halachas and itzrachas. That is the most important Hachano. It's Tony Bar Mitzvah. He has to know how to keep it. He has to know what to do. Number two, to do the Maimir Balpeh at his Bar Mitzvah. Number three is to do a pilpul. Number four, if he's not doing a pilpul, do a speech with a Dvar Torah. Number five, do a, number five and six are, I would say, equal. None of them come before each other. Either do a Siya Mishnayis or Yudbeis Prakim or do both. It's a Hisafa and Limit Torah that's encouraged by Rabbi Seinu and do it in honor of your son's bar mitzvah, beautiful thing to do. Next, I would say, is to be, learn how to be a shliach tzibur. It's not something you must do now. I will mention that uh, Ramatul Shusterman, who was the Balkaira by the Rebbe, the, there's a sefer about him, which I don't recall the name of that sefer. And in there he has a story where the Rebbe once instructed him, in the early years of the Rebbe's Messias, um, where the Rebbe says, now it seems to be the minute that even Bacharim are shliach tzibur, I, I, the implication of that is that it used to be, I guess, only married people went to the Amud. A Bachar wouldn't go forward. But the Rebbe tells him, now that I see Bachar going to the Amud, it's a shame they shouldn't know how to do it. And the Rebbe even said, I'm not talking about doing the Hakayinim on Musaf of Purim, I'm talking about a regular Mincha. And the Rebbe asked them to do Shliach Tzibur training for the Bachar in 770. So I think it's a great thing to do, a Shliach Tzibur. And the last two things would be Kriya Satayra and the Haftarah. So this is what I believe based on all the Hirais of the Rebbe, everything that we know from the Ma'inas, the Yechidus and the Sichais, uh, all the sources, this is the priority. Hilchas Tefillin, Halachas Netzrachais, Ma'imer, Pilpul, Speech with Advar and then the rest. Let's talk for a moment about Halachas and Netzrachais because it's not only about Hilchas Tefillin. Your son is going to be obligated to keep all 630 mitzvahs. He has to be fully ready. For example, he has to start being careful about Saizman Krishma, he has to make sure that he's wearing tzitzis that are the size of minatayra. Some boys are maybe a little more petite or smaller. They wear a size 14 tzitzis or size 16. You're not yoytze the mitzvah with that. It has to be an amma by an amma. So you go to the store, you can ask them exactly what size it is, if it's size 18 or 20. But when they're bar mitzvah, they have to wear tzitzis properly. They have to say shema properly. Maybe start doing shnai mikra vachetargom and other such things that need to start taking place once they turn bar mitzvah. Now before we go on to the preparation of what the parents have to make, let's talk about your children for a little bit and let's talk about anxiety. So anxiety is very prevalent these days. So any child who's already struggling with anxiety, when their bar mitzvah approaches, it's like turning up the flame. It gets, the anxiety comes out in the open uh, much higher, much stronger. 
And even boys who never, you never saw your child experience any anxiety and he was always happy-go-lucky, when it comes to their bar mitzvah, they could be anxious. And the reasons are obvious because um, public speaking is considered one of the biggest anxieties for many people out there. Um, very often they're worried about how the bar mitzvah is going to look and my, some of my friends might be wealthy or they have a fancier party, mine is less fancy, there's like a social anxiety and um, they're also saying something about pet, forget about speaking in public, about pet in public, they're worried they're going to blank out, that they're going to forget. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to be nervous. So the first thing to know, and that reduces the anxiety, is that it's normal to be anxious for the bar mitzvah. And you, together with your child, could figure out ways to reduce the anxiety. For example, if your son is anxious, one of the ways to reduce the anxiety is not make him lay in for his bar mitzvah. Or not make him do the... The haftira. You can take some of the responsibility that he doesn't need to do, take it off him. Or if he's very anxious with his mind, how I'm never going to be able to learn this about pet. You sit down, you break it down. This week you're going to do these three lines. This week you're going to do these three lines. The regular simple tip, tips of just taking the challenge and chopping it up a little bit and helping to reduce the anxiety. Discuss it with your son, you know, validate his feelings and, and be there for him. One of the best lines that I often repeat that I've learned about anxiety, which uh, for me is always like a guiding light, is anxiety very often could actually be doing you a favor, anxiety, and you could talk to your son about this, anxiety is not a bad thing. For example, I was a little anxious about tonight's event, so I made sure to prepare better, and I came here early, and I made sure everything was up and running, so that anxiety helped me, it uh, motivated me to do a better job and to, to work on this. So one of the best lines I heard about anxiety is that anxiety is okay. And it's fine, and not just it's okay, it could be your friend, it could be doing you a favor. There's only, when could you identify if the anxiety is healthy or unhealthy, the difference is if the anxiety paralyzes you or the anxiety mobilizes you. So, if your son has a test in school and he's anxious, so he's paralyzed and he can't get out of bed that morning, we have a problem. But if your son has a test in school and he's anxious, so because of that, he asks his father to learn with him, and he gets up early and he chazers, and he goes to Yeshiva Sarev the night before, and he does a better job and immobilizes him to prepare for this test, that's a fine anxiety. That's totally fine. And the same thing applies with adults. If they have a certain procedure that they need to do at the doctor's office, and they're so scared of it, they don't go, that's a problem. But if they you know, figure out other ways how to do it in a safer way, in a way that it hurts less, or... Um, that's more comfortable, then uh, that anxiety is fine. So th just to keep that in mind, anxiety is very normal before the bar mitzvah. Keep out an eye for it and you could address it. Most parents could address this anxiety with their own children. Um, without any therapist, parents are the best therapist for their own children. Now let's talk about the parents' preparation for the bar mitzvah. So we're going to go through a bullet a list and then we're going to talk about each one again. You have to order tefillin, you have to get tefillin bags, Hat and jacket, suit, choose a date, plan the event, reserve the aliyah. And we're going to have a slide about each one. And everything's in the handout. If you're following along, you can catch up. We're somewhere there in the handout. Okay, let's talk about ordering tefillin. So first of all, order if you have not yet ordered your son's tefillin, please order the tefillin ASAP as soon as possible. There is no greater headache for a boy who had his enough tefillin and not to have his own tefillin. It is so not fair to them and so annoying to them to borrow their father's tefillin, their cousin from Zal, to daven in a different shift. It's really not fair and, and it just ruins the excitement and it's a big headache. And uh, boys are very excited for their Amachas tefillin. They're very excited and part of it is having their own tefillin. So if you didn't order, please order it ASAP. Second of all, plan to have them in advance and I think it's totally okay. I'm not uh, encouraging anybody to lie. You don't have to tell your the cipher the wrong bar mitzvah date. Don't tell him the bar mitzvah date. Just tell him the date that you want the tefillin by. I'd like my son's tefillin by next year Hanukkah. Doesn't matter when his bar mitzvah is. That I'm, I'm the customer. I'm paying you. I want them Hanukkah. And do that if your son's on a tefillin. It's like perm time. Give it a couple of extra months. You could always expect delays. And there's COVID. And there's inflation. And there's shipping. You know all the answers. So give it a couple of extra months so that you actually have your son's tefillin. And by the way, if your son's tefillin will come the night before and you have them on time, you still didn't do him a favor. The anxiety that he'll have the month, the month before, not sure if he's having them, is also not fair to him. So plan to have them in advance. It's the smartest thing to do. Do your own research which cipher you want to order your tefillin by and you want to order good tefillin. When I spoke to the different cipher a few years ago, before preparing for tonight's event, they, they told me about this concept they encounter often where you have a boy, he uh, goes to yeshiva, he's a chassid shabachar, he's, you know, he's connected to Hashem, he's on his own already, he's 18, he's 19, he's getting married, he comes to check his tefillin, 
They haven't been checked since his bar mitzvah. Nobody checked them. And they check his tefillin. The sefer says, uh, sorry, your tefillin are really bedieved. Where did you get your tefillin from? They're not mahudr at all. You have all these issues with your tefillin. And, and they, they see the, this bachar faint in their office. This guy's 23 years old. He's about to get married. He finds out the tefillin that he's wearing since his bar mitzvah. His parents bought him. They didn't do research. And they went into a random store and bought him a pair of tefillin. And has all these issues that it's only kasher with the Eved and not even according to the Balta Rebbe. Or whatever the issues may be. And there could be various issues. So therefore, you, you don't want your child to have that buyer's remorse. It's better to make that investment to buy a good kasher, mahodr de kapir tefillin, something that he can wear for life and be proud of. And every time he comes back from the cipher, he gets, you know, aleph, aleph, plus, plus. And uh, he has a beautiful pair of tefillin, and you have to do your own research. Uh, many cipherim that sell tefillin here in Crown Heights are very happy to show the children their own tefillin being made. And I think that's a beautiful thing to do, something I would like to take my son to see his own tefillin being made. So there's a lot of parts to making tefillin. So first of all, there's making the batim, which means the houses, the bias. Uh, Rabbi Mendel Oltein, his number is there. I hope it's in the handout. If not, you could, uh, I'll share these slides, like I said. He's the only one here in Crown Heights who actually makes batim here in Crown Heights. And you could take, he's, he told me that I could announce that he's open. Anybody could come to him any day and watch him make batim. We also brought him here to Yeshiva last year. Mirz Hashem will do this year again for the seventh grade and next year for the seventh grade. Lina, there, Mirz Hashem. But he's the only one who actually makes batim. But there's the writing of the tefillin. So very few cipher are actually writing tefillin here. But if they are, let your son go watch a little bit. Often the tefillin are being written in Eretz Yisrael. But even if the tefillin are being written in Eretz Yisrael, there's the assembly. The cipher gets the bias, he gets the tefillin, he has to roll it up, he has to put it into the bias, and then he has to sew it, and then he has to paint it, and then he has to attach the ritzuis to it. There's more parts to assembling, if let's call it that, the tefillin. Different cipher are doing different amounts here on premises, and if you're ordering local, you could be in touch with the cipher. You know, my son's tefillin arrived from Israel, and you're putting it into the bottom. Call me, I want to be there. I want to come with my son. I think it's a very nice thing to do. So we covered ordering tefillin. Tefillin bags. So also order with enough time in advance. You don't have to pay for rush fees and your kid doesn't have to be nervous about it. And um, I'm not here to promote um, spending money or any establishments, although I want to thank Prestige for sponsoring tonight's, tonight's uh, free leather tefillin bags. I'm just putting this out here because this is a question that I often get. There's a plenty of uh, fathers, I would say, that they got a velvet tefillin bag with every mitzvah and they're very... Um, nostalgic about it and they want their son to have only a velvet tefillin bag and they think that leather is maybe modern or like why does my son need it but um, a little too late in the game the reality is I didn't do this but the reality is that everybody gets leather so if your son requests a leather tefillin bag it's a very fair request from his point of view and then you could you know, take it up with him uh, but you do not have to lately there's a, I, would, I would call them a shagas where boys are spending eight, nine hundred dollars a thousand customizing matching their favorite colors and that's, I don't think you have to do that. You go for this plenty standard, off the shelf, beautiful, beautiful tefillin bags. Uh, one of the things they do very smart these days that they didn't do when probably all of you had your bar mitzvah is that on the inside of the tefillin bag, they, you could embroider your name and your email address and your address and your phone number. And of course you pay per letter, but it's, every, it's worth it. You know how many times you see a pair of tefillin lost and pictures going around on, on social media and whose tefillin is this? And they, only, they were cheap. They only put the guy's initials, so go figure out who this guy is. Or even if it says his name is Moshe Weiss, it's not going to help you much. But if in the inside there was a phone number and an email address, how brilliant is that? And don't only do it on the large tefillin bag, do it on the Rashi's as well and on the Rebbeinu Tam. Because Lubavitch of Akram do go of time, they often split up their tefillin and then they leave their Rebbeinu Tam on the shelf in Zal and their Rashi's on the train. And it's good that each bag that they own, in the inside of it, you put the email address and a phone number. So if they get lost, they could be returned to you without a problem. Those you aren't seeing around the social media because those just get returned to their owners without you even knowing about it. So that takes care of the tefillin bag. If to get a hat and jacket in advance, in yeshiva we want the Talmudim to wear a black or navy jacket. And you have to get a suit for your son's bar mitzvah. Some parents get their son like a cheaper hat for weekday so it gets a little more beaten up and they don't have to be so careful about how they keep it. And a more expensive hat for their bar mitzvah and for shops. Planning. So... One thing everybody in this room knows is you know your son's bar mitzvah. You know the date. So now what you need to do is you have to choose the date of the celebration. You know when his birthday is, but you need to choose the date of the celebration. So first of all, when should you make your son's bar mitzvah celebration? Minit Chabad is to make it the night following the birthday. If not possible, you make it the night before. So for example, today, today, as in Tuesday, today was 
Beis Shvat. So if somebody's birthday was Beis Shvat, Mene Chabad is, it says clearly in Sefer Menagin, that La'erev tonight should be his Bar Mitzvah. If for some reason tonight doesn't work out, let's say today was a Friday and you don't want to do a Friday night Bar Mitzvah, so you could do it last night, because last night was also Beis Shvat and it is the day of his Bar Mitzvah. So you do it the night of the Bar Mitzvah, which is tonight, or the night before. That's when you should choose. If needed, you can make your Bar Mitzvah at a later date, and later we're going to talk about a Shabbos Bar Mitzvah, a Sphere of Bar Mitzvah, a Summer Bar Mitzvah, and we're going to talk about different scenarios that people are always wondering about. <clears throat> you can make it at a later date, but one thing you cannot do, and there's clear hierarchies about this, you cannot make a Bar Mitzvah early, because Bar Mitzvah Shabbos, you can't celebrate it Thursday night. He's not yet Bar Mitzvah, you cannot make his Bar Mitzvah early, you could postpone it and make it later. Now, if you are making it later, this is also very clear, I read the Rebbe multiple times, where the Rebbe says if you're postponing the big celebration, then you have to do something that people refer to as the Bay Bayayim on the day, on the day of the Bar Mitzvah, there should be 10, boy, 10 men gathered and family, you should say the Maimur, and the father of the Bar Mitzvah boy should say the Bar Taira, and the boy should say the Bar Taira, celebrate his Bar Mitzvah, even if it's a breakfast or a lunch, but with a minion, you have to celebrate parade his Bar Mitzvah, because that special day is the special day, like we started off, tonight's event. Now, here in Ali Torah, we can have uh, 140 Talmudim in the grade, and sometimes we can have boys that are shared on the same birthday. We do want to avoid that two classmates should have our mitzvah on the same night. It used to happen a couple of years ago, and it's uh, not a good thing at all. And it causes a lot of stress and a lot of uh, politics, and usually one of those bar mitzvahs is fancier, and the boys want to be at that one, and one is less. And uh, friends start choosing where they're going to go. We have to get involved. And the parents chipped in. We got a van. We have 12 kids go here, 12 kids go here. And then they swap locations in the middle. But it's not, a, it's not a fun experience at all. And it's totally avoidable. So therefore, we are going to share a Google form with everybody. And we're going to ask you to look at the calendar, see when your son's birthday is, figure out when you're making his actual bar mitzvah, and put it in that Google form. And then the results of that form, which is just the dates, nothing private, no social securities, just your son's name and his birthday and the date of the celebration, we will share publicly. I review it as well to catch doubles. And you could all see it and make sure that two people don't do it on the same night. It's happened before where we discovered the problem in advance of the bar mitzvah, but the parents said, I can't change this. I printed invitations, my sister booked her tickets already. You know, I wish I knew a month ago, I'm flexible. I could have done it the night before, I don't care. But they simply didn't know. So we do want to avoid that and that's why we share this Google form. Now it's important, even if your son might say, ah, don't worry about it, nobody in my class has the same birthday as me. But that's okay, but your son's birthday could be, let's say, on a Sunday. He could have a classmate who has his birthday on Shabbos. And he could have another classmate who has his birthday on Friday. And those people don't want to make a Friday night or a Mitzvah Shabbos bar Mitzvah. They're, they're making a Bay Bay Ayim and they're doing a Sunday night Bar Mitzvah. So they're choosing the same night as you. So you can't just rely on your son saying, nobody in my class has the same birthday as me. You need to really make sure that nobody else in your son's class is planning to have a bar mitzvah on the same time. We had a record this year, Chafi Tevis, which was just last week. We had three boys in the same class who had a bar mitzvah on the same exact day, in the same class. And Baruch Hashem, the parents were flexible and worked it out. And one bar mitzvah was Tuesday night, one was Wednesday night, and one was Thursday night. And there was no, no harm caused, Baruch Hashem. So, and it's important to note that it is okay if your son's bar mitzvah is on the same night as a, as a grade mate. Mm-hmm. So we have Kita of Vavala, of Abayz, of Gimel, of Dal, of Behev, of Av. If your son's a Mavdalit and there's a boy of Gimel making a bar mitzvah, that's totally fine. But if they're same class, that is when it's going to be an issue. The, the spreadsheet will be shared publicly. Now let's talk about planning the celebration, something that you could also start doing right now because you know your son's birthday, there's no reason to wait. I would say reserve the whole in advance. You already know the date. Don't delay. And every year I get an email like tomorrow morning from Lavar Yeshiva. Did you have your bar mitzvah event last night? We got like seven, seven reservations came in. Why do I say this? Because um, there's not many halls to make a bar mitzvah. Some people maybe make a small bar mitzvah. I haven't been to bar mitzvah in a boy's house in years. In a smaller shul, occasionally standard bar mitzvah these days. I'm not saying you need to do this. I'm telling you what's standard is Lavar Yeshiva, big hall or small hall, JCM. That's standard. Now, there's only one Lubavitch Yeshiva, big hall, if that's what you want. Um, besides the fact that you're competing with a 140 boys in the grade, not, obviously not all having a bar mitzvah the same day, we're not the only boys in Crown Heights. There's a lot of other yeshivas, I would say collectively, between Mishan Parkway and Crown Street, and the Isle of the Arcade, like another 75 boys, besides for the 140 of our Talmud and Manali Torah. So there's over 200 boys having a bar mitzvah next year. 
Plus, if you live in Karnaitz, you know this as well as I do, that there's a lot of events. There's Junior Neshe, and there's Must, and there's um, Shifra Pua, and you know, you name it. There's auctions galore, and PTAs, and everything. So, they reserve halls well in advance. They know already. Kines HaShluchim, Kines uh every organization you heard of, they're having events all the time. And they're booking their halls in advance. But you could beat them to it if you reserve the hall for your son's bar mitzvah. Tomorrow, I say, why not? Go ahead and reserve it. If you know you want to make it on the JCM or Lavav Shishim, you know the night, book it tomorrow. Just put down the deposit, and then you, you could cause you, you could avoid a lot of stress of figuring out where to make a bar mitzvah. Should we now make a Shabbos one? Because anyways, his date is not available. And all those conversations which happen to people. So I'm trying to encourage you to avoid that. Um, you need to reserve the hall, okay? You need to reserve a caterer, a musician, and a photographer. And again, I'm not here to promote anybody specifically, but uh, Lubavitch Yeshiva does have a bar mitzvah package. So if you sign up for the package, you get a standard bar mitzvah. They give you a, the hall, and they give you a choice of a caterer, a choice of a musician, a choice of a photographer. But they deal with the caterer, they pay the caterer, they pay everybody. You just give them one payment, and they take care of it for you. And that, I would say, most bar mitzvahs that I go to are the Lubavitch Yeshiva bar mitzvah package. Now, Lubavitch Yeshiva did ask me to announce that you can make a payment plan. So if, let's say, your son's bar mitzvah is in 14 months, so you can make a payment plan, uh, reserve the hall tomorrow if you'd like, or you could do it tonight, and you can make a pay- call them, say, here's my credit card, charge me $500 a month for the next 14 months. By the time you come to the bar mitzvah, $7,000 is paid, which is, I think, most of the package cost, of the package fee. And then when you have the bar mitzvah and you're paying for the tefillin and that and jacket and the suit, it's not that all of a sudden, you know, 12, 13,000 or 9, 10, Thousand, seven thousand was taken care of. Some people find it easier to structure their payments that way. Lubav Chishiv is happy to do that for you if you would like. Needless to say, uh, I, I've missed it before that all boys in the class must be invited to the bar mitzvah. There is no such thing as a, a boy excluding a friend not inviting a classmate to the bar mitzvah. Okay, let's go back to Lubav Chishiv. So they have a standard bar mitzvah package, and there are people who like to upgrade it a little. So you could add wine in the head table or on every table. You could add nicer tablecloths, centerpieces, but that's just about how far maybe some people go. Besides for the people who really go all out, that's, you know, I would say normal to do. Um, you have to also book, uh, reserve their invitations. And it's nice when the boys invite their previous rebbies to the bar mitzvah and their previous mechanchim. They only need one invitation to hang up in their class. They do not have to hand an uh, invitation to every single boy in their class. One is enough to hang it in the class and it's perfect. Some boys like to hand it to everybody, but they don't have to. Bar mitzvahs are often called for 7 or 7.30, but personally, most bar mitzvahs I, that I attend don't start before 8, 8.05, 8.10. So if you call it for 7, the only thing you're going to have is the bar mitzvah boys' friends. They'll be there 7 o'clock sharp. For the whole hour of 7 to 8, you have only the friends. If you call it for 7.30, you'll have only a half hour of that. So you can call it for 7.30, and you need to make ventures. So these are the things that parents need to plan in advance. Reserve the hall. Cater, musician, photographer, invitations, and ventures if you would like. And, of course, if you would like, you could give out a, a chura, a memento, something special, uh, you know, some likud or a kaivitz or something like this in honor of your son's bar mitzvah. You could prepare that in advance as well. Let's continue with the parents' preparations. So we're actually wrapping it up. So we spoke about ordering tefillin. We spoke about the tefillin bags. We spoke about the Adam jacket, the suit, choosing the date planning the event. Now, let's, after your son turned 12, and he did all those hafanais, and you already planned the event, which you could do now, now we're already holding two months before his bar mitzvah, and we have the exciting date of his Hanachas Tfilin, and let's talk about the Hanachas Tfilin. So, the Hanachas Tfilin is meant to take place exactly two months before your son's bar mitzvah. Now, Hanachas Tfilin is the first time that he actually puts on Tfilin in Shul and Davins with them. Some people, uh, there's no source against or for this, I'm just mentioning, some people practice the day before at home, not for davening, just literally practice a little, putting it on, taking it off, so that even though they're going to show for the first time and doing the Rafa's and it's not completely foreign, they already had a little bit of practice, I believe it's something you could do, it's not something you have to do, but davening with it and putting it on the shul happens two months before the Bar Mitzvah. The Rebbe spoke about deducting the days of Yom Tif that fall out on weekdays, so you don't get two full months, so they, they deduct from the two months, and you should add to the beginning. So let's get, say, for example, if somebody's bar mitzvah would be on Yud Tamas. So his Anachas film would have to be Yud Iyar, which is two months before. But Shavuos was on a Tuesday, Wednesday, they're in the middle. So he lost two days. 
So he shouldn't make his anachas one on Yod Iyar, he should make his anachas one on Ches Iyar. Add those two days that Shuas took out from his, from, his, uh, from his two months. And when does the boy start, putting up, start making a bracha? So when he has his anachas tefillin, he does not make a bracha on the tefillin. And there are no rules of when to start making a bracha. Some people make up rules, they say two weeks in, one month in, on Rish Chaydesh. Those are all uh, made up. The one clear instruction of when you're supposed to start making a bracha is when the boy is puts on tefillin well enough, he's good at it, that he puts it on without any hefsek and without any issues, and he doesn't need anyone's help, and he just puts it on and wraps it on regularly like an adult does. That means he's good at it, he's able to start making a bracha. Until then he doesn't. For your son, that could be a weekend. For a son, your son, it could be six weeks in, four weeks in. Everybody has to determine that on their own. There are no rules about when to start making the bracha. The only rule is not to do it right away, only to start when you're good at it. Most people make do the Arnachas at 770, or some people by the oil. And when you have the Arnachas fillin, wherever you dive in in 770 or by the oil, there's a small celebration that takes place. Uh, you know, you pull out a little tablecloth, depends how well prepared you come, a little garbage bag would also be nice. And you put out some juice and some azinus, and he says the first ice of the mimer, people wish l'chaim, and that's it. Sometimes mothers call me and they ask me if mothers need to go to that event. The answer is no, they don't have to. A lot of mothers are excited to go, and they're in all the viber shows with cameras, and you know, it's very exciting, and you're more than welcome to go. But mothers do not have to go to their sons and office fill in if you're able to, you know, enjoy. It's beautiful. Um, that takes, that's the small celebration that happens in the shul. He says the first ice of the mimer. And then, most boys, they'll go, after davening, they'll go to the oil that morning, because it's a special day for them. They'll go to the oil, and then they come to yeshiva, and they, they'll celebrate the Hanach in, in class. For Hanach in class, it's similar to a birthday. You give out like a donut, or a Danish, or a ragala, and you can bring grape juice for l'chaim, and you can bring a drink. The class sings the Maimon again, he sits in the front by the teacher's desk, he says the first ice, and they celebrate his Anachas Tefillin in class. No mashka should be brought to yeshiva. If when you were a kid, maybe you came with mashka and you went around to all your teachers, we don't allow mashka in yeshiva anymore, but you could certainly bring grape juice if you would like. Um, the boys are very excited for the Anachas Tefillin, so you're not only ordering 25 donuts, make sure to order for every cousin, neighbor, bunkmate, shulmate, and um, you need probably 50 donuts, and they walk around yeshiva with their hat and jacket, beaming, and they're giving every mechutin a donut, and it's nice. I'm, I'm not making fun of it, I'm just telling you what happens. So um, be ready for that in Mirza Hashem. In yeshiva, we give every boy in honor of their nachas phone this little gift. The Alter Rebbe writes that when you put on tefillin, you're supposed to have a certain kavana in mind, and it's printed beautifully on a, like a hard plastic that you could keep in your tefillin bag every morning before you put on tefillin. You could pull it out, read it. So we give that to the Talmudim as a little gift in honor of their Hanachas Tefillin. And in Yeshiva we give permission for the boys to miss Shachras here in Yeshiva for one week. So if their Hanachas Tefillin is on a Tuesday, that Tuesday through the next Tuesday they don't have to come to Shachras in Yeshiva so they can daven with their father or uncle or someone who's going to daven with them and help them. However, your son is more than welcome to come to Yeshiva the next day and me or any of the staff that are there are happy to help him and if it doesn't fit with your schedule. It's not okay for your son to be late to class for that whole week, that he should come 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock because his father davens late, because then he misses a week of learning. It's not, it's not appropriate. But if instead of davening in yeshiva at 8 o'clock, he'll daven in another minion at 8 o'clock or earlier and be on time to class, that is something that we give permission for one week so the boy could daven at his father and uh, get the help he needs. And again, we offer help here in yeshiva as well. Should be on time for breakfast or class, as mentioned. Class gift. So there's a minig that the boys chip in, and they give a certain amount of money for each bar mitzvah, and they buy the boy a gift. If you do the math, essentially every boy is buying himself his own gift, but it's still a very nice thing to do. So a mole, it was done that every bar mitzvah, another kid was in charge, everybody had to bring $5 and collect, and it was a very big headache. The nicest way to do it is if a class mother usually, it could be a father, it's usually the mothers that do this, volunteer, and they, you know, with electronic payments, Zelle, PayPal, Cash App, everybody gives a certain amount of money, and then you buy the gifts, and at the bar mitzvah, the class presents a gift to this boy. And keep in mind, if you're doing that, that uh, you have, you know, you're buying 25, you have $2,500, if let's say you took $100 from everybody, so you could negotiate, you could go to the store and say, listen, I'm buying 25 sets, and you get yourself a good deal, 
Another thing you could do is you don't have to store them all in your house. You could go to, let's say, Sasa versus Farm, I'm just making that up, but any establishment, and say, listen, here's $2,500, I want 25 of this particular set, and I'll call you every time I need one. He wraps it for you, or Jadek or Mayfits, wherever, Kahas. So it's uh, not such a big deal to do these days with you know, class chats. This is a good way to use a class chat, and um, this is easy to collect the money this way. Now we're holding the actual day of the boy's bar mitzvah. So he had his anachas fillin, he has his mimer, his pilpul, he made his siyam, he knows his 12 prakim, he put on his anach, he had his anachas fillin, he's making a brach already. The class gift was bought. Today is the big day. Today is his bar mitzvah. So let's talk about that. So first of all, on the day of your bar mitzvah, you do say tachnon. You do say tachnon, and the rabbi explains in various sikhas, maybe letters as well, that you might think, oh, it's such a big simcha, the day of Bar Mitzvah, why say Tachna? Because at the same time that it's such a big simcha, it's also a very serious day and a very important day, and it's a day that you urge want to use out to say Tachna properly and start off being a full-fledged member of Kal Yisrael. So we do say Tachna, and the Rebbe has instructed people that on the day of the Bar Mitzvah, they should go to the oil, so it's a minute to go to the oil on the day of your Bar Mitzvah. It says clearly in Sefer Menagam, from the few Menagam, that says clearly in Sefer Menagam, composed by the Rebbe, about a bar mitzvah, it says that there should be a gathering for the family that day of the bar mitzvah, besides for the celebration or the event, the family should have their own little gathering. Here's the quote, it says, Menhagi Labavich, Achrei Tfilas Shachris, Misasfim Biyachad, after Shachris, you gather together, Hayreya bar mitzvah, Aymri Mile Sachad, Yislachoyda Simcha, the parents of the bar mitzvah boy say a few words in honor of the Simcha, here it says clearly that the bar mitzvah boy should say a maimer chesidus. You give out some cake and some juice or mashka. In that evening, you make a celebration. So on the day of the bar mitzvah, you could do something like this. After shachris, you could do it in your house. You don't have to do it on a shul. And you do not need a minion for this. If your bar mitzvah is that night, you do not need a minion for this. If your bar mitzvah is postponed, and you need to have a baby yayim, which we spoke about, then this is a great time, have a minion, so you're doing your baby yayim. But if you're having the bar mitzvah later that night, or you had the bar mitzvah last night, and today is the morning of his bar mitzvah, and you finish shachris, you can go to your own dining room table with your own siblings, your own family, your own children, and make a bar mitzvah without a minion, it's totally fine. Let's move on with the bar mitzvah celebration. So that was the day of the bar mitzvah, now comes the big celebration. So, the Bar Mitzvah event is a Su'udas Mitzvah. It's not a pizza party, it's not a camp reunion. It's a certain style event. There's different style events. You can go to an auction, you go to a school dinner, you go to a camp reunion, you go to a Dubai party, you go to a Su'udas Mitzvah. A Bar Mitzvah is a Su'udas Mitzvah. You're celebrating that this young boy, this young man, is now Mechayv in keeping Kal Hatayra Kula. The Bar Mitzvah needs to be a Chassidish event. We are a Chassidish Yeshiva. We have Chassidish Talmidim, we hope that they're all very Chassidish and grow in their Chassidish kite, and we're a Chassidish community, and that's the only way to pass that our bar mitzvah should take place. It should be a Chassidish event. It's not appropriate to turn the bar mitzvah in any, to anything other than that. The Rebbe writes as follows to a letter. So let me tell you what the question was. The person asked the Rebbe, they, um, they suggested, you know, why should we make this bar mitzvah celebration? Let's make a private event in our house. You know, let's make a small celebration. Should we celebrate it privately? So the Rebbe answered, no, you're making a mistake. You should celebrate the Bar Mitzvah publicly. You should make an event. There should be a soda. You're celebrating a huge thing. Your son became a chayv mitzvah. But it has to be in a certain style. So let's read this together. The Rebbe, after the Rebbe tells him in the letter that it should not be a private event. It should be a public event. So now you think the Rebbe is encouraging, like, you know, the biggest dinner in town. So the Rebbe clarifies. Move on. It's understood. She'en kavanasi bahanal. My intention is not with what I mentioned. Libizbuz ma'is. To splurge and waste money. Ella, rather, Shetia, this is a quote, what the Rebbe wants of our mitzvah to look like. Mesiba, Tyranis, Chasidusis. A Tyradika, Chasidisha event. So be a Tyradika, Chasidisha event. Vahamishat, from those participating. Ya'achlu Livnam, they should wish your son, your, yours, yeah, plural, like your son. Shigada Elias, Yerishamayim, Chasid Alamdin, that he should grow up to be a Chasid and Yerishamayim. And alam. So here you have a clear definition from the Rebbe of what a bar mitzvah should look like. It's a suddhis mitzvah, it should be a celebration, it should be besimcha, you should have music, and uh, you're not being more chassidish if you keep it small in your house and don't invite anybody, or if you don't have music, or if you're not celebrating, that's wrong. It's meant to be a public celebration. But what style? Don't waste your money. And it should be a tayradikha chassidish event, and people should come and enjoy. 
Um, and, you know, the Rebbe mentions that you're celebrating the fact that your son is becoming a uh, mitzvah of Isa and that he's now mechayv and keeping kol terukula. There were many times where people asked the Rebbe if they should travel, they should go on some heritage trip, or go to Eretz Yisrael, or travel for the Bar Mitzvah, and uh, most of the answers that I saw, there's countless answers where the Rebbe rejects that idea of traveling, and where the Rebbe says that a local event is preferable, I'll pull up one letter over here, uh, I have it small, it's harder for me to read, but the Rebbe says, uh, I'll, it's in Hebrew, but I'll read the English, the, I'll try to translate as I'm reading. The Rebbe says, going to Eretz Yisrael, Ratzi Veshuv, back and forth, even if it's only the parents and the bar mitzvah boy, is going to cost at least $1,500. Now, I don't know what year this was written, but $1,500 for three tickets was considered a lot of money. So, the Rebbe says, Ubevadai, underline, ye eschus gadol shal bar mitzvah, will be a great schus, that if they will not allow themselves to spend that money, lo yar shal avaz v'schum zel anal, v'yasa bar mitzvah dafka kan, you should specifically make a local bar mitzvah, and people will be able to be mishtativ, and his friends will be able to come, and there will be limit at Torah, and they'll be able to go to the oil that day if you're here. So the Rebbe rejects the idea of traveling and totally encourages a bar mitzvah with friends, with guests, with taira, and a chassidish event, and save your money, but spend it on a beautiful, nice event. There were many times where the Rebbe told people not to go on a trip. There was even an organization that was making a bar mitzvah for Yusayimim, and they thought they had this great idea, they're going to take the Yusayimim on this trip, and they're going to tour the whole world. And uh, they thought they're doing a beautiful thing. These are Yusayimim, they don't have a father. Let's make them happy on the day of the bar mitzvah. And the Rebbe said, no way. The bar mitzvah is not a time to have a trip. You can make the bar mitzvah, you can do beautiful things for your assignment many other times, many other ways. And many, there are beautiful organizations that do that, but not on their bar mitzvah do you take them to, on, a, on trips. So the bar mitzvah celebration, like we said, it's a chesedish event, it's a tayridik event. We're celebrating that he's becoming mechayv a mitzvah. It's not a goodbye party, it's not a reunion. And it should be local. And on the day of the bar mitzvah, the bar mitzvah boy needs to give tzedakah, that's a clear hayra, that the bar mitzvah boy gives tzedakah. Now, I tried looking for a source to have a pushka on every single table, I did not find. There is hayra of the Rebbe, that by a there should be a pushka on every single table, and that all the people who attend the wedding should give tzedakah, was chos to kala. It seems that the minute transferred, and by every bar mitzvah lately, you see pushkas as well. It could, I'm sure tzedakah is a beautiful thing, I have nothing against it, but I don't have a source for that, that you'd have to have a pushka on every table at a bar mitzvah. However, for the bar mitzvah boy himself to give tzedakah, there's a source for that, and that should, that should be done. And parents often ask me, do I need to hire a counselor, a teacher, somebody to sit with the class at the bar mitzvah? So I'm proud to say that Baruch Hashem, we speak about it a lot here in yeshiva, and of course we hope that you speak about it at home, and 99% of the time, the boys really behave beautifully at the bar mitzvahs. We talk about it, we encourage it, we compliment them. And um, we really talk about it a lot, the teachers, myself. And the boys, for the most part, really do a very nice job. They're levitic, they're involved, they sit nicely. They do a pretty good job. You do not have to hire somebody to sit with them. However, if you want that, you, you're more than welcome to. Sometimes you could call me, and those people who want to be tutors are often open to such a job. And I could give you the right kind of guy. Usually it's like someone who was their counselor, somebody who knows them, somebody who maybe substituted them, was a good yachas with them. So that is an option, but it's not needed at all if it's a local bar mitzvah here in Crown Heights. Let's talk about the actual event. What does the schedule of the night look for when you're running the bar mitzvah? What does it look, look like? So this is something I think very important that I would like to stress, that it's your event, you are emceeing the event, unless you get somebody to do it, a brother-in-law, a nephew, a son, you're them seeing the event and you are running the event. There is no party planner. There's nobody else making the event happen. I've gone to bar mitzvahs that were dragged. You come there and nobody's just walking around and walking around and walking around. And you see the little vegetables on the plate and no movement. And the only reason why the bar mitzvah didn't start is because the bar mitzvah boy's father, he's not a, an event planner. He has some kind of day job that he has no shaykhs to running events. And nobody let, like press play on this event. Nobody like said, Brucham Abayim, welcome, please take your seats music, tell the caterer to serve. So just like it's 9 o'clock at night and you're doing nothing for no reason at all. So it's very important for you to realize as the host, it's your event, have a schedule, and you need, if you don't want to be burdened with it, it's very easy to type up a schedule and give it to your sister, brother-in-law, nephew, somebody, to just oversee the musician and the lead waiter to keep the event moving. And you're emceeing this event and you're inviting everybody and making the event happen. The best thing you could do is to ask family to come on time, because people in Karnites come late, Baruch Hashem, there's simchas every single night. Then they don't take each bar mitzvah that seriously. And you don't want to start when it's empty. But what you could do is, not on the groups, private message, you text your brothers, your sisters, your parents, 
We want to start on time. Please be there by 8 o'clock the latest. And we really want to start. Pictures are whatever time. And like this, you have your family there. That's all you need. And you start the event, and the guests will come whenever they come. If, if it allows, like in the winter, you start the event before you sit down to the meal, you daven mayriv, and the bar mitzvah starts over the MC opening up the event. The first thing you do is you read the Rebbe's letter. Now, of course, if you have the Rebbe's letter written to the bar mitzvah boy's father or to the bar mitzvah boy's zaydi or a relative, you have a real letter that the Rebbe wrote. It's not just a copy from a sefer or not just from a phone. Um, it's much nicer and it's more special if you're able to arrange that. After the Rebbe's letter, some people add in the Rebbe's capital. Often they'll honor like the younger brother to read the Rebbe's capital. If you do that, please have him practice the Rebbe's capital so he doesn't have to make mistakes in public. Then, after the MC opens the event, and you do the Rebbe's letter, and you do the Rebbe's capital, you start the mimer. You have to do the mimer nigan, do the mimer. The mimer, like the words, Isa b'medrash tilim, the latest it should start is 8.15. And if the mimer is done properly, we're already holding 8.30 by the time the mimer is over. So if you rewind, we're talking about opening the event at approximately 8 o'clock the latest. You say, Bruchim Abayim, whoever the MC is, welcome. The, Re the Rebbe's letter, the Rebbe's capital, the Maimer Nigin, and you start the Maimer by 8.15 the latest. Then goes the first dance. The first dance should be around 15 to 20 minutes. And you can ask the caterer, this is what I suggest, is that you ask the caterer during the first dance, um, is when they you know, clear up whatever the appetizer was, or if there was soup, which they served before, they clear that up as well. In the hand that we made the schedule a little clearer than it's up here. And um, during the dancing, they should already put the main course by the kids' table. So when the kids are done dancing, they sit down, they already have their meal, and then the adults sit down, the waiters go around, and they serve them, and maybe there's a choice, and they could take care of that. Uh, let's say 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, people relax, you finish the dance, main course is being served. Most people have it. Now is when you do the formal part of the bar mitzvah, when all the speeches take place. The father should speak. It's appropriate for the father to speak at the bar mitzvah. Or Zaydi speaks. The boy makes his him if he has a I mean, Now he says his pilpul. Now he says his speech. That's when all this takes place. Then you could, um, as the main course is, you know, they finish serving everybody the main course, they could already come give dessert to the, to the class table. They're, they're looking forward to the dessert. So give it to them. Okay, the father makes a speech. Now, often at a bar mitzvah, there's a second dance. So, lately, a lot of bar mitzvahs do this. A lot of weddings do this. I think it's a nice thing to do. Before you do the second dance, you kind of bench. and Because nobody's staying for the whole second dance for now, another 45 minutes, and then sitting back down. People forget to bench. The original people are washed, already leaving. So, a nice thing to do is... After you had the opening event and you did the mimer and you did the first dance and you did the main chorus, you did the pilpa and the speeches and everything, now it's nice if you bench, you know, you do the benching and then you serve dessert, let's say buffet style, and you have a second dance and you could dance, you know, till 10 o'clock. So then you do the second dance. Again, Berch HaSamazin I think is better if it's done before the second dance, but either way it's fine. And we would like that the classmates should leave by 10 o'clock. And I know I do not enforce that. There's no way that I'm going to be at a bar mitzvah. And even if I was there, I'm not chasing boys out of a bar mitzvah at 10 o'clock at night. My day job is, keeps me busy enough. However, I do think that it is ridiculous that boys should stay at a bar mitzvah past 10 o'clock for a lot of reasons. There's no need for it. And um, it's not safe. Literally between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, walking the streets of Crown Heights, the level of safety decreases. Like 10 o'clock, there's still a lot of people. Stores are still open at 11 o'clock. It's a different world. And um, it's mind-boggling to me that parents, who I sometimes speak to, and they're very concerned about something here in school, and uh, you know the slightest safety issue, which we try to take very seriously, and I'm not mocking anyone, and we try really to take it seriously, and then all of a sudden, like 11.30 night, their son is walking home alone, and I, I can't understand it. I was never able to wrap my head around it. Additionally, your son will not only be attending 25 bar mitzvahs. Every boy who's turning 13 has a lot of friends that are 13, from Ali Taira, from the other schools. And everybody's hyped nechotan. They go to the bar mitzvahs of their whole class, and they go to the bar mitzvahs of the class that they used to be part of, because they once switched classes, and they live in, let's say, Crown Condo, so they have all their neighbors, and they go to this particular class shul, so they have this, and then they have their bunk mate, and then they have their cousins. And before you know it, the average boy in seventh grade, Bli Guzma, is going to 45 or 50 bar mitzvahs. So if your son is going to go to sleep 12 o'clock at night, 50 times a year, you're killing his year. You're not giving him a chance to thrive, to sleep, to be healthy, to come to yeshiva, wake with a proper head, ready to learn. You're just really not affording him that opportunity. Even if you go home at 10 o'clock at night, it's late, but it's much more manageable. So I think that the parents together should all insist that their children come home. The bar mitzvahs should end at 10, 
And depending how far you live from Lubavitch Yeshiva, you say, I want you home by 10.05 if you live down the block. If you live further, you say, I want you home by 10.15. And this is something that the parents could do together and you could utilize the class check because your children are very good at making you feel like the odd one out and you're the meanest, you're the worst parent, you're the only nerd who makes me come home on time. All my friends could stay to 12 and their mothers don't even tell them anything and all their kids are telling that to their mothers. But really, if you all got together and you all insisted that it ends at 10 and you come home, it's way more responsible for the walking and for the safety. And even then, they should only w walk in groups and, and they could lead a normal life that year. Otherwise, it's just a year to waste with so many late nights. So that's something that we leave up to the parents to enforce. And yeshiva does start on time the next day after bar mitzvah. Again, if we were in out of town yeshiva and there was four classmates, we would maybe take up a whole day of yeshiva for boys bar mitzvah and we'd go and come and celebrate, but there's, there's 50 bar mitzvahs a year. 40, 50, I'm not exaggerating, that your son will be attending. So we can't afford that every time there's bar mitzvah, we start late and then early and come, and just we, we, yeshiva has to operate. We do start on time the next day. We make exceptions in an extreme case. For example, recently we had three bar mitzvahs in a row for a class, so after the third one, we let them start an hour and a half late. Or if like, there's a bar mitzvah on a matzah Shabbos and it's in uh, Staten Island, so there's no way they're coming home on time, we'll make an exception. There's, sometimes we make an exception, otherwise yeshiva always starts on time the next day and we, we expect the Talmudim to be there. If you live out of Crown Heights, we have about 15 to 20 percent of our Talmudim are not from Crown Heights. They live in Shipset Bay, and they live in Brighton Beach, and Staten Island, and Westchester, and Long Island, and all around New York City. So if you live out of Crown Heights, so it's your responsibility to please hire safe transportation. You know, a normal driver with a license and proper insured bus uh, to do that properly. And also you have to hire somebody here. You need a chaperone, you need a buffer, an adult. Somebody going to be on the bus with the boys. And it's your responsibility to communicate those details to the class some way, through your son or through a chat, through the school, that where the bus is leaving from, when it's coming back, a link to follow it so the parents can come meet the kid. You have to be, uh, you have to communicate, and people can be, I don't know, where's my son? He's in Staten Island, I have no idea where he is now. It's not right to the parents and to the Talmudim. And there are, like I said, 15% on average in each grade are not boys from Crown Heights, so this, this does happen. If you have a bar mitzvah on Shabbos, these are your options. You can make a bar mitzvah, you can make a Friday night meal, you can make a Shabbos day meal, you can make it on matzah Shabbos, or you can make it on Sunday. But if you make it on Sunday, just remember to do the bay bayayim on Shabbos. If you have a bar mitzvah during Svira, you could, some people like to postpone it because they want only real music, so they push it off to Lag Baimer or to after Shavuos. However, you could do it during Svira, but I strongly recommend that you do hire like a choir or a singer because it's a make it or break it. If you go to a Svira bar mitzvah and there's no music and there's nobody even on the mic, it, you don't really get dancing and it's just a shame for the bar mitzvah boy. But if you even have one guy on the mic and he's singing along, you get a choir, you, you invest a little bit in it, it makes a huge difference. Somehow there seems to be a hat there that they're allowed to come with one beat. So you have a lot of these singers, they come with not a whole music, but it's just like a beat going, and it gives like a little chayas to the bar mitzvah. I guess that's a lot, because I see everybody doing it, but I, I, I don't know, I never asked the Rav. Um, I asked a, sing a guy once, he said, yeah, the Rav lets me, so that's, that's the, the extent of my source. But uh, it's certainly encouraged that you have a singer, so there's some dancing and something going on at that bar mitzvah. If you have a bar mitzvah in the summer, this is also a very common question. So first of all, remember to do the bay bayayim. If you're not taking your son out of camp, travel to camp, Make sure you have a minion. Usually by that point, he is all bunk is bar mitzvah ready. Summer's ready later, so you do a bay bay yaim. And then when to do the, se the celebration. You could do it in camp. Some people do it only in camp. You could pull him out of camp and do it somewhere in the Catskills if that's where your son's in camp. You could bring him into the city for the day and send them back to camp. You have all these options if you want to do a bar mitzvah on that evening as usual. Or you could, of course, do the bar mitzvah after camp. You cannot do it before camp. If you do the bar mitzvah after camp, then you're not locked on a certain date, please don't choose the first day of school or the second day of school. There's no mitzvah that the boys have to have a bar mitzvah on the first, the night before yeshiva starts or the first day of school when we really want them to settle in, get used to bedtime and, you know, get ready for a new year. So if your son's bar mitzvah is the first day of school, you don't have a choice. But if your son's bar mitzvah is in the summer, you could do it like a week after school started. You don't have to do it the day that school began. Now another option for bar mitzvah in the summer that we offer to parents is the Anachas Tefillin, like we described, is a simple event, happens in the classroom, the class doesn't go to 770, no family doesn't come to the class, he does Anachas Tefillin in Shul, and he does one later in the class, and it's very simple. For boys who are having a bar mitzvah in the summer, and their friends won't be there, because they're doing it in the city, and their friends are not coming in, the camps are not letting their friends come, or their friends are in camps that are far away, 
we offer the parents that on the day of your son's Tanakh's tefillin, you can make a nice enhanced Tanakh tefillin for your son's class. You could do like a lunch in your house and the Rebbe will come with the whole class. You could even have music, you could even have a photographer. You could serve a fleshik soda, like 12 to 1, one day the class will come. They'll sit there an hour, hour and a half. So your son gets an enhanced Tanakh tefillin. You could do a breakfast as well. And then on the day of his bar mitzvah, he knows that he already celebrated with his friends. Otherwise, we don't do that type of Hanukkah tefillin, but it's an option for a summer bar mitzvah. Now, these are the bar mitzvah guidelines from Ali Taira that we're asking all the parents to please um, follow these guidelines and partner with us in, in maintaining this responsibility that we all have to each other of having um, responsible events, safe events, chassidish events, and because we are Ali Taira, to adhere to the highest standards and even if that's not your personal standard to realize you're in a community and you're in a school community and you're, we're all responsible to each other. So these are the Bar Mitzvah guidelines. First of all, please explain the value of Bar Mitzvah to your son so he understands what you're celebrating that night. That sometimes changes the whole perspective. Like how we started off tonight's event. It should be a Hasidic atmosphere. It should feel like a Hasidic Bar Mitzvah. There should be Hasidic or very Jewish music. No DJs. Now the reason why we don't allow DJs, so if you don't know what a DJ is, that's totally fine. If you do know, most of you probably do know what a DJ is. And the reason why I say no DJs is technically the DJ could put on a chayach for you and it could be the most chassidah of our mitzvah. And technically I know the one man band could play the, the worst songs that are not appropriate for a bar mitzvah here in the Rebbe Shkona for Ali Taira Talmidim. However, the nature of a DJ mm. is to play the latest rock and roll, latest hit songs, uh, inappropriate songs, and he has every single song in the world, Jewish, non-Jewish, at his fingertips. He's under pressure from people in the crowd to do it. They also have like sound beats and tracks and different effects that they mix in, uh, which is part of why, why they get paid more than a one-man band, is because they have this equipment and this expertise. And the nature of a DJ is to turn the bar mitzvah into a disco, for lack of a better word, uh, to turn it into an inappropriate event. Therefore, it is Ali Terra's policy that we do not allow DJs at bar mitzvahs and Baruch Hashem, this year, that rule has been kept by all the parents of the seventh grade, and we are very grateful for that. We're grateful that that's what our students, the types of event that they are attending. Um, it's your responsibility because it's your event. I had to deal with this like maybe twice, but I had to deal with it that there should be no alcohol ending up on the classmates' table. No sweet wine, no dry wine, no hard alcohol. It does not belong anywhere near the classmates. And if you're having extra mashka and wine floating around your hall, please make sure that it does not end up by the children. It's on your responsibility, on your watch, that that's happening. Um, and there's nothing needed at the bar mitzvah to make the bar mitzvah boys wild or silly. And I'm not coming out from a modern or chassidish perspective. I'm telling you simply to have a nice bar mitzvah. I go to so many bar mitzvahs. I go to over 100 bar mitzvahs a year. I try my best to make it to each one. The, the chassidish bar mitzvahs or the normal bar mitzvahs are beautiful. The minute you bring out the bracelets and the necklaces and the sunglasses and the light up stuff, the kids get wild, they get silly, they start trying to wear three of them, two of them, backwards, and they, they don't focus on dancing, they don't dance with the bar mitzvah boy, and it just ruins the event. I'm not talking from a Hasidic perspective now. I'm talking simply from having a beautiful bar mitzvah. They need nothing. The boys have the energy, they have the chayis, they have enough shtick, they make pyramids, they make helicopters, they spin, they, they fly, they have all the excitement. They have everything without any props. They don't need any props from you. And we're asking that you don't have confetti, party hats, light-ups, bracelets, necklaces, glasses. Some of these things are even inappropriate for the boys to wear. Some of it is just simply silly. Simply silly. The boys band, they dance beautifully on their own and neither is there a need to hire a motivator. Out of Crown Heights, you go to a Litvish Bar Mitzvah, it's like part of what you have to do is you have to hire like this motivator. A guy comes like in his suspenders and yellow pants and he teaches the boys dance moves from the latest Yeshiva Boys Choir or something. Our kids don't need that. They know how to dance. They're good at it. They don't need anybody to motivate them. I've seen Bar Mitzvah's parents brought a motivator. The kids looked at this guy like, what are you doing here? He says, Either they were uncomfortable with the dance moves he was trying to get them to do, or they, they, they felt that the guy was weird and they just didn't connect. It's not needed. Our boys do a great job at dancing without that. And safety. So there used to be, we stopped it, we talk about it, it's important, that they put the boy in this tablecloth and they flip the boy up in the air and he literally lands back in the tablecloth inches from the floor and there's been injuries and um, it's very dangerous so you need to be careful. All dancing you need to be careful, but I'm not saying you shouldn't dance. Injuries will happen. Over the years we've had injuries. We once had even from jump rope, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do jump rope, but the boys like to take all the napkins, tie them together, make a jump rope. We had a bar mitzvah boy who was on the smaller side, and he was, the boys who were doing the jump rope were 
doing it rather forcefully. And the Bar Mitzvah boy, you know, eventually you trip up, right? You miss the jump rope. And they, they, when they did it, it picked the Bar Mitzvah boy up in the air and he flew in the air, landed on his head and went in Atzala. And that was the end of his Bar Mitzvah. It was very sad every time I think about it. It happened like three years ago. So you need to make sure that even if they're dancing, Lebedic and everything, keep an eye that it's being done in a proper way and any of the shtick that they're doing is fun and exciting, nothing that's considered dangerous. Again, I don't think we should outlaw the jump rope, but just something to keep in mind. The tablecloth thing should certainly be banned and not allowed at all. If you see the classmates bring a table to hold the boy on the table, some adults got to be there as well because they could easily drop it. So you have to just, you got to keep an eye on the safety of your son, if it's his bar mitzvah and of the classmates and everybody else who's there. Um, please don't send your kids with a smartphone to the bar mitzvah. First of all, it's not fear to the other parents who are trying to protect their children from being on smartphones. So one boy comes to the bar mitzvah with a smartphone. Most of the holes in Pran Heights have open Wi-Fi and the rest is history. Plus, even if it's locked and you took it to tag and it has all the filters in the world, even if it has just a camera, it turns into such a distraction because they take videos of the first dance and they sit the whole meal during the speeches watching the videos, editing the videos, or they're playing a game and you can see it in a second. You walk into Bar Mitzvah, you see like six kids hovering over one boy. You know there's a smartphone there and it ruins the event. Now, of course, as parents, I'm a parent myself. You want to be in touch with your older children when they're out of the house. You can get those flip phones or dumb phones. You should have one in your house. And I, I call it the kid's phone. And if any of my children leave the house, I give it to them. There's no internet in it. There's no, I don't need a filter in it. It has only call and text. And you should get one before next year for your 13-year-old son if you want to be in touch with him. If you're picking him up, you want to talk to him on his way home. It's a good thing to have, a regular phone. But the smartphones, even the locked ones, even the ones without service, without a SIM, with every filter in the world, still manage to be a huge distraction and perhaps even inappropriate at the bar mitzvah. And make sure that the children walk home in groups. These are the Ali Tarah bar mitzvah guidelines. We're almost done, like two, three more slides. So parents are the same letters as partners, and you're our partners, we're your partners. Together we strive to raise Hasidisha, Talmidim, Hasidim, Rishmaim, Lamdanim, and please work together with us. And uh, this is the yeshiva that you chose your son chose to send your son to. Partner with us in following these guidelines. These are not my guidelines. These are we started off the event for whoever was here on time. You saw the importance and the specialty of the day. The Gemara Knis is Nafshalikis, he becomes Mukhaiv and Mitzvis, it's his Matan Taira, it's his Chanukah Sabayas, it's Ani Ayam Lidaticha. It's such a special day, it has to be celebrated in the proper way. Now, after his bar mitzvah, your son gets his first aliyah. So, first of all, um, practice the brachas with your son in advance. He says baruchu, that he repeats baruch. A lot of kids don't know that. And which bracha to say? When you say asher bachar, when you say asher nasan. I was once at a, a boy got his first um, aliyah, and he said baruch was Hashem baruch. And the whole crowd repeats baruch. Now, he didn't know that. So he thought the crowd was correcting him. Because he said baruch, and they said baruch. So, so he says, I know, I know. <laughs> He felt like uh, that they were making a mistake. So teach your son what he's going to say, what the crowd's going to say, when he's meant to respond. Practice the brachas in advance. And it is our minute that the first aliyah takes place the first possible time. It's all. The bar mitzvah boy is a chiyav. He has to get an aliyah. There's a list of shulchan aruch. If there's like a yard site, a bar mitzvah boy, a list of a yaitzel who's the chiyav. Bar mitzvah boy is high up on the list, if not the highest, I'm not sure. But he's high up there. And he has to get his first aliyah possible, either on a Monday or a Thursday or Shabbos Mincha, not on Shabbos morning. Now, if you have your son's bar mitzvahs on a Tuesday, like today, and let's say it would be Rish Chaydesh, or it's Chalamayid, or it's Chanukah, or it's Chal- uh, Yom Tif, so should you get an aliyah then, or should you wait till Monday, Thursday, or Shabbos Mincha? There's different areas of the Rebbe, depending on different situations. I can't answer each one. I don't know the answer to each one, but there, there are sources out there. The Gilean Eskashros once had something about it. So if your son's bar mitzvah is like on Rish Chaydesh, Chalamayid, Yom Tif, and you're not sure if you should get an aliyah Monday, Thursday, or on a Shabbos Mincha, or should you get a midweek, please look into it yourself, ask a rav, find out. But otherwise, the standard is Monday, Thursday, or Shabbos Mincha. Now, it's very important to reserve your aliyah in advance. Most people want their son's first aliyah to be in a special place, either 770 downstairs, the Rebbe's room, by the ayah. Now, keep in mind, we spoke that there's 140 boys in the grade. So you, you're competing with the rest of the grade. And it's not like the bar mitzvah, where only if your bar mitzvah is the same day. On Monday... Anybody who had their bar mitzvah Sunday or Monday gets their aliyah. And on Thursday, anybody who had the bar mitzvah Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday gets the aliyah. And it's not only your son's class. It's your son's class and it's uh, all the classmates of Alatera. And it's the other boys from all the other schools. And guess what? It's the whole world. 
There's plenty of people who fly in for their first aliyah from Israel, Australia, California. So there's hundreds of bar mitzvah boys getting their first aliyah. They all want to meet in some 70 downstairs Rebbe's room at the aisle. And if you, they come from Israel, they book tickets, they, re, they rent a place to stay, they have their tickets, they have it all worked out. They reserve their Leo. You're like, okay, and then you call the Gabbai a month before. He's like, you're crazy, this date was booked 11 months ago already. So I don't know how far in advance they book it, but wherever you want your son's first Leo to be, reserve it. Yeah. Same thing, by the way, if you want to make a Kiddush in your Shul. Reserve with the Gabbai and that Shul, make him market in his calendar that your son's laning that week. It's your Kiddush. We had a story not too long ago where two people booked the Kiddush the same week. It, it caused politics, which wasn't mine, but I, I got pulled into it, you know, to try to help. It, it's unfortunate. Just be clear, do things in advance, and then everything will, you'll avoid a lot of Agnes Nefesh. If you want to have an Aliyah downstairs, you have to reserve it by Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Kratz. That's his number. I hope it's in the handout. If not, we're sharing the slides. If you, if you want to do it in the Rebbe's room, you have to get it by Rabbi Meir Harlig, and those are his numbers. And if you want to do it by the oil, I'm not sure how to go about that. And the father of the Bar Mitzvah boy makes a bracha of Baruch Shev Tarani by the, by the first aliyah. He makes a Baruch Shev Tarani, but he does not say, our meaning is not to say, uh, so he says, Baruch Atah Shev Tarani. He doesn't say, Elikeinu, Hashem Elikeinu. He doesn't say Hashem's name. So, and he doesn't say, Malacha Elam either. So the father makes the Baruch Shev Tarani. I'd like to conclude tonight's event by wishing everybody with the Rebbe wishes, every Bar Mitzvah boy, in honor of the Bar Mitzvah, that they should be Yosef, Hasmada, Shkida, Belimudai, the Taira, Beter Samnigla, Vehem Beter Sachsidis, the Yahadir, Bekim Bar Mitzvah, Yisra Hashem Yisbarach Yat Slichai, Yisra Chassid, Yer Shemayim, and Alamdin, your son should grow up to be a real Nachas to you. The truest, best Nachas is Yiddish Nachas, Chassidish Nachas. You should grow up to be a Chassid, Yer Shemayim, and Alamdin. On your way out, we have raffles to make. On your way out, um, remember that we have this for everybody as a chura in honor of Rabbeinu Afton's yard site tonight. This is the first edition. If you see any mistakes, please let them know. This is a special print that we had made yesterday for us. Nobody has this. You're the first ones to have your eyes on this. And it was sponsored by the Hickson family. So you could get this on your way out. Additionally, we want to thank Prestige Embroidery for offering us a free tefillin bag. Someone here in the room is going to win right now. $600 towards a tefillin bag. And Bellissimo hats for offering two hats. So we're going to make two raffles and a hat. And Hasaifer offers uh, $400 towards your son's tefillin, 200 towards Rashi, 200 towards Rabbi Natam, and Machen Stam, $300 um, for off your son's tefillin. Um, I will share with you via email and WhatsApp that Google form for your son's date, please fill out that Google form. And thank you for joining tonight. Here goes the raffles. Okay, so the first raffle is going to be on the most expensive item, and then your name gets pulled out. And our first winner, I'm not writing it down, so if you win, please don't be shy. Please be in touch with me tomorrow. I'll put you in touch with the establishment, and you'll, have, you'll get your prize. Uh, the first winner is as follows. I just mixed it. Last year we had two pa uh, father and mother win. It could happen again. Here we go. Four prestige embroidery. All right, you'll be in the next raffle. There you go. Yep. Four prestige embroidery. The mother of Elio Mani Niazov is the winner of the free Tfilin bag. I think you have to get two Tfilin bags for the twins, so I'm happy you got one for free. All right. Our next raffle is two hats of Bellissimo hats. So the first hat will go to, I'm mixing it. Try to get someone who came on time, maybe not. Let's see, all right. Um, Bellissimo hat's first winner is the father of David Kamen. <laughs> For the second hat of Bellissimo hats, the winner is the mother of Maisha Friedman. There's a lot of Friedman, so I'll say her name, Mrs. Rifki Friedman. Let's move on to our next raffle for $400 towards a cipher. The winner is, again, please be in touch with me because I'm not writing it down, but I want to make sure that you get your prize. The winner is the father of Levi Guppin, Mendy Guppin. $400 at a cipher. And for our last prize for Machen Stam, the winner for $300 at Machen Stam on Kingston Avenue is, let's give it one more mix, pull one out from the middle. All right, here we go. And the winner is 
the father of Menachem Lieberman, Shia Lieberman. Thank you very much for joining. Please take this on your way out.